Okay, we are lively with an amazing crew. <laughs> Standing for Truth is here. This will go well, right? <laughs> oh, of course. It's, it's always a good time. It's always it's a good always time. Fun. Monday night fun. Right. It, it, it's, an, it's an honor life. being on your uh, on your show. Yeah. All is fair, all is fair in love and war, as they say. <laughs> hey, just because we disagree doesn't mean we can't be friends. Oh, yeah. that's, a, that's my fair. best friend's an agnostic. Come on. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm a little stronger than an agnostic. But that's okay. <laughs> Hey, well, at least we can bond over coffee. That's hey. true. That's true. We got something in common. Yeah. So were you around when Jason Ezard melted down last night? No. I did you hear um, it? I think I left the after show uh, maybe about 45 minutes after. I was kind of tired after the debate and stuff. So no, I, I didn't I didn't see any of that. Oh, uh, that was epic. It was epic. It was just unbelievable. Uh, it woke me up. I, I went and made a pot of coffee, and I stayed up till like three thirty. So, oh, so you drink coffee late too, then? Uh, no, normally, normally I don't. I try to go to sleep because I get up at about four. But uh, last night I decided, you know what? I don't really care anymore about time and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it all just blends together. Anyway. I mean, this whole you know being stuck in my house—it's just like become sort of a a battle between me and you know depression and. Uh, I, I don't know what else. Me, myself, so, and I. Yeah. What is our? <laughs> you can have debates with yourself. What part in the you hell? Can be the creationist. The other party, you can be the evolutionist. Oh, I can try that. <laughs> I, I I got two more of your books today from uh, well, Raw Matt's books. What are the odds and evolutionary rescue device? So uh, how many more of the books? Two. Two more. Yeah. Two me, more today. You're, you're the one putting my kids through college. I mean, I, am. I keep yeah. writing these books and you keep buying them. I might be able to retire within the next year. Yeah. If your kids need, <laughs> uh, if your kids need some good books on evolution and stuff, just call me up and I'll hook them up. Listen, I've sold six, five to you and one to my wife and she hasn't read it yet. So, <laughs> so, so how, that's all you've sold. How many? Have no, you sold? I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, how, how many have you sold? Speed. Speed. Okay, you know what? If if you can if you can guess within ten, I'll tell you. But if you're uh, way off, I I can't tell you. That's we're gonna make this fun. Uh, sixty-seven. Sixty-seven. You're not within ten, but you are pretty close. No, I okay. think it's in the I think it's in the nineties. Okay. And I think I think oh, most of them shit. have been to you. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was gonna say ninety two. You know, well, you're cl there. You go. You're close. I don't know. Yes, According I to Amazon, they're the. I, I hear they're a little bit off, but yeah, it's it's in the nineties. So. I don't know if you I don't know if you know it or not, but if you hold down your mouse key on that Amazon one click, it just keeps <laughs> ordering. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying I could have a thousand sold by the end of the yeah. night. Probably could. You know, wow, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be busy tonight. Actually, one thing that's on my mind. So you said you had a pot of coffee at 3.30, but typically you get up at 4.30? I, I had a pot of coffee at 12 last night, and I stayed oh, up to keep you up till 3.30, but you slept in a little bit this morning? I slept till 7.30 this morning, which is extremely late for me. So about a four-hour sleep. Yeah, but I had two naps, so. <laughs> <clears throat> I. I started taking my cues from my cats. They seem to know what they're doing. Right, right. Yeah, so they go to sleep, I go to sleep. So, so. you're a cat guy versus a, a dog guy then, eh? I'm both. You're I, both, I, yeah. I, I love St. Bernard's. He's like so 30 you, raccoons. And so I have do you have raccoons. a dog and a cat then? Uh, our our, our, our St. Bernard, we had to uh, let him go about two years ago. Mm. He had hip dysplasia. Ooh. His name was Dozer. He was nine years old and he couldn't walk anymore. We had me and my son had to, uh, we got a harness for him and we'd each pick up, it, it had four handles and we'd have to carry him out. Yeah, it was, and he, he just got so that he wasn't enjoying his life anymore. So we had to let Dozer go. It was a horrible thing because he was a young dog, right? Nine right. years old. Yeah. It's never easy. Oh my you know, God! With us, it's always the same that it just it hurts too much when we put them down. So we always say, you know what, this is the last dog we're gonna get, and within a month or two, we end up getting another one. It's just too yeah. hard to live without man's best friend, you know. Yeah. And I love cats too. Unfortunately, the allergies to them, I love them, but within an hour of being around a cat, the eyes, the throats, yeah, I I I they're, they're cute. I sneeze every morning. My cats just brought a mouse in the house, so. Oh boy. 
Yeah. There's more affection sessions. Yeah, and he's uh, he's uh, under this uh, padding I have for my computer. And <laughs> you just have a dead mouse under your computer. Dinner time. If, if, like, here no, you go, Daddy. Never no, gets hungry Daddy, in the middle of the live stream. Speaking. No, Walker, you don't understand. They don't kill the mice. They just carry them in the house and then they <laughs> chase them around. So if I start screaming like a girl, it's because the mouse ran up my pant leg. <laughs> hey, it yeah. happens. It, it happens to the best of us. It does. <laughs> the mouse is looking for the mouse is looking for a safe place. The whole poor damn thing's traumatized, or it's going to get killed by your cat. Yeah, yeah I know it, it's never going to be the same. If I look down and see the mouse, um, you know, sitting right there, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'd be I'd scream. <laughs> this coffee would be all over the place. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm pretty good around like wildlife, except for like spiders and snakes for the most part. Yeah, snakes. Oh boy, spiders and snakes. Don't get I can't snakes. even hold. I can't even hold a snake. There. What? It was about a year ago. We. I mean, where I live, we don't see too many snakes. But we were going for a walk or on, on a trail that that we're around. But a year ago, my daughter would have been three, and then all of a sudden, just some gardener snake came slithering right by, and my daughter was traumatized for the next three days. Right. <laughs> Not fun. Not fun. Yeah. The thing is, like, I remember when I was younger, like you know, okay, you know, you you hold a snake or something like that, and you let it do what it tries to do. It's just the weirdest thing about snakes that annoys me is like they will try to find like whatever position aggravates you the most. <laughs> they will coil themselves around you. Wrapped around your neck. Yeah, right. and it's like, okay, you could choose anywhere to do it, but you chose my neck. Really? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Now the question is, would you would you hold one of those anacondas? Oh mm. dear God. I, yeah. I I've had friends that have done that before. No, really. Like, no. Uh uh. <laughs> no, I don't I, I don't think you could pay I don't think you could pay me enough. Would you rather no. fight an anaconda or a lion? No, anaconda. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, but I mean it, it's the snake that, though. If the snake is big enough for me to ride, then I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I know, think anacondas get pretty big. I think one of the most scary experiences I've had with wildlife was um like in elementary school. It's amazing the type of shit they can get away with. So they had like a wildlife per professional come in, you know, okay, you know, we're protecting bald eagles and you know, because the eagles are trying to survive and people are poaching their nest and all this other crap. Okay. Well, which of you wants to uh, <laughs> which of you wants to hold on to this glove? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm like eight years old, so I don't know what the hell's going on. I'm like, oh why well, I, I will. And immediately the tone shifts. It's like, okay, well put this on your hand and don't move a muscle. Like, don't think, don't move. And within seconds, this bird, like this bird, it's like a hawk or an eagle or something. It comes down like clutches you know <laughs> whoa, like 20 feet in like three seconds and it's like laying on my hand I'm like, whoa okay so that's what it's like to be the prey for a bald eagle okay yeah. your, your life flashes right before yeah. your eyes well when it comes to wildlife it's 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 funny how like for example when i get i, I can't stand centipedes and oh really yeah, centipede in the house like it's just so small compared to us as a human. But yet, you know, the way I kill it is I'm either using an entire roll of, of um, paper towels, which my wife right. kills me for. You know, it's a waste of money, or like the biggest shoe or boot that I got in the house. <laughs> right, and they're hard to catch, man. They can. They move. are hard to catch, yeah, and they're disgusting and, too. Do you, do you know what else is cool? We've got. A, I don't know if every species does this, but we have the ones here. They're they're green and black. They're really pretty under a microscope, but they actually throw off their legs, and their legs start twitching. If you pursue them, they throw the they'll they'll, they'll rip off their legs and throw it behind them, and the leg twitches for about a minute or two. No, oh. and. And that is their defense mechanism to get away, get away from prey. And 
I mean, if if I were chasing somebody and he ripped off his leg and threw it, yeah, <laughs> threw it at me, I, I think I'd let him go. <laughs> Man, that's a badass yeah. shit. Yeah, you know? that, that, yeah, yeah. That would be pretty. Badass. It's like those sea urchins that just puke their guts out at you. It's like, okay, yeah. okay, I'm backing off now. Yeah, that person would earn the earn, earn my respect. I think right. he's some kind of mutant from X Men or something, ripping off his leg and tossing it at me as a defense mechanism. <laughs> So the reason we're gathered here is because of your debate last night. Your, uh, your what we feel is your misunderstanding between uh, mutation and hypermutation, and at the same time, uh, uh, inbred homozygosity among a population. So wait a minute. Two things. Two things. Did you just say my name? Misunderstanding. Standing. I did. And misunderstanding. We did. You and us as yeah. Misunderstanding. Not red-handed. Uh oh. And uh, homozygosity, heterozygosity. I've, I've never heard these words used before. <laughs> Can you define right. these terms for me, there, Speedy? Understanding. They sound cool, though. They do. Sound like yeah. a really snazzy yeah. argument. Yeah, like it, yeah. it just it, it it just flows off the tongue. It does. I want a shirt that just says, you know, one side homozygosity, the other side heterozygosity. With RJ Downer pulling out his hair. <laughs> just kidding. I love RJ. Like one side's a solid color and the other one has like tie-dye. Yes. Actually, you know what? I, I like that idea. I think that's going to be the next shirt. I'm going to send it. You know what? Since you've bought 99.9% .9 of the books there, <laughs> I'll get that shirt made and I'll send it to you. I'll just need your address. Cool. I can give you my address. Misunderstanding. Oh, wait a minute. Should I give you my address? <laughs> you can well, try. Then you'll have a whole, whole, yeah, yeah. whole of creationists just traveling in groups. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not one to, to take it. You know, I, I can disagree and debate and discuss, but I, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I ever um, attack somebody, attack somebody's personal life, that is. You right. know what I mean? Like, I've never debated somebody to the point where I just hated them, where I just had to mess with their personal life. It doesn't even, it doesn't even cross my mind to be honest. Yeah. As long as you don't give it to, to Maddox or Smokey or uh, uh, Jason, Jason Ezzard, that, that would be frightening. <laughs> hey, they love you too. They love you too. So, okay. So um, wh what are your thoughts then on the, um, and then I'll just kind of sit back and, and soak it in. But what are your thoughts on the hypermutation for, so for the Neanderthals, Dr. Jansen has two explanations as, as uh, Dr. Stern, Cardinal and I discussed the, uh, he, he proposes that maybe the DNA itself has been subject to chemical damage and is therefore not reliable. Uh, Dr. Dan and I agreed that it is reliable for the most part. And the second explanation is the hypermutation. So we could just skip right to the hypermutation. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Why do you feel like it's, it doesn't work? Um, and if you want to kind of reiterate Dr. Dan's arguments there, go ahead. I'm, 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 I'm genuinely interested. Okay. If there was a human line, you know, that basically came off of, you know, uh, point A and went up and then a branch came out and that was your Neanderthals, right? That's what you're proposing. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you have, yes. Yeah. And it, when, it, would be, it, would, it would have been a breakaway population. Correct. So it would be, a, it would be a branch off. And you said something about for timing, you said something around Babel. You know, I, I hold a slightly different position regarding the Neanderthal. So I do believe that a lot of the breakaway populations were post Babel when it comes to Homo floresiensis, when it comes to Arachnus, Nelidi, for example, um, but I believe Neanderthals, based on their physique and based on how well adapted they appeared to be, I, uh, I'm more comfortable saying that they probably broke away from the main population pre-Babel. So I don't think that they were part of the actual Babel event. I think that they were already migrated to Eurasia and Europe, for example. So hmm. pre-Babel, when, when, uh, how does Babel relate to the flood in timing? Um, within, within, I'd say, f well, definitely within a thousand years after the flood, probably within, well, let's go with 500, 600 years, 500 years. 
Okay, so <laughs> he's taking so sometime, notes. sometime. Uh, so that would be forty four hundred, probably uh, maybe five thousand years ago. The Neanderthals broke off, so five k, right? So if we're going with the if we're going with the pre pre Babel, then the Neanderthals would have split off. Oh, so it would be after the flood, but before Babel. Exactly. So if the flood okay. was forty five hundred years ago. Let's say forty. Yeah, let's say Neanderthals split away about forty-two hundred years ago. Four point two k. Okay. So then your your idea is that they split off, and then all these changes happened to them after that, and they became the brows got bigger and they got beefier and bigger brains, that sort of thing. Yeah. Good question. Like I've I've watched a lot of lectures um, from the secular side regarding human evolution and multi-regional theory out of Africa theory. And they all seem to agree, the experts at least, um, the ones that I've watched, they all seem to agree that their physique was influenced by the cold and harsh environments mm -hmm. in the, like the, the ice age um, type conditions, for example. So they all admit that, you know, the Neanderthals were incredibly robust. They'll say that they were well adapted to not only that environment, but various other environments. Actually, they go through, it's very interesting. They go through the skeletons and they show how the striations within the skeletons reflect just how muscular they really were. Um, yeah. So I would say that a lot of their features though, like especially the robustness and the, um, the brow ridges, the, the larger nose, um, they've even said is helps retain heat, for example. So yeah, those would be uh, adaptations via environment, probably. And you believe those happened through mutation or what? Environmental changes, therefore, probably, probably epigenetic. You're gonna it's, say it's the epi word, <laughs> okay? So you said the epi word, okay? <laughs> I know you love that word. Uh, see, yeah. see it, it seems to be unanimous decision that it, it, consensus in the lectures that, that I've watched and the papers that I've read where they say, um, I mean, they admit there's still so much they need to know about the Neanderthals, yeah. but there seems to be a general, and if, if, if you guys have uh, heard anything differently, let me know, but there's, there seems to be an overwhelming consensus that the, the physique, the atypical features are the result of environmental related conditions. And we do, we do know that environment can influence the epigenome. I mean, wouldn't you agree with that speed? No, not that much. No. Uh, epigenetics is not your, it's not a miracle worker. I mean, it can do some things, you can shut genes off turn genes on, you know, for based on uh, heat shock or, you know, <clears throat> something on that order, but it is not going to, well, it can have an effect on evolution, but the way it has an effect on evolution is that it, it, if it does change the phenotype enough to survive in a different environment, <clears throat> that gives mutations a chance to be selected for that environment. But if it doesn't happen pretty quickly, then you're going to, uh, epigenetics is not going to save you. Epigenetics is not going to survive for more than a few generations. It's going to have an effect. So it's not going to change a population other than through this uh, hypothetical mechanism that they are talking about now that could possibly, like behavior before mutation is kind of the, kind of the hypothesis, but... Let's set that aside for a moment. Epigenetics is not capable of changing a phenotype that much. Not not to the point where you get a big brain. If it were, every time we uh, went to northern Minnesota, or, you know, we'd start to grow bigger, right? <laughs> well, we have to could grow. Maybe that explains why I'm such a fucking genius. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it, Speed. We just solved it. Well, yeah. um, when it comes to the adaptation seen in the Neanderthal, like I said, to, that helps to generate and retain um, body heat, the fact that they had large noses and strong brow ridges, like you said, and they had larger brain sizes, um, just a little similar to modern humans, but a, li a little bit bigger. Now, if they were closer to 
um, creation and the flood, for example, um, after the obviously after the ark, if this was pre Babel, then it all depends what with that people those people would have looked like. Like how big were their brains? Because um, when it comes to epigenetics, which is just the the study of gene expression, you know, switching um, chemical genetic switches that flip genes on and off based on these. I'm not saying it is epigenetic for sure. I'm, I think that there was some influence there based on environment, but how would you explain, I guess, according to your position, how would you explain those adaptations? Cause as I said, it, there seems to be overwhelming consensus that those um, atypical features, the uh, robust physique, for example, the big nose, brow ridges, they were the result of the harsh environmental conditions of the ice age. Like the evolutionary community agrees with that. Would you say that's due to mutation then, Speed? Yeah, yeah, mutation and selection. And over a period of, what, 400,000 years or something on that order? I mean, that's that's reasonable. So, so but I guess according to – but you would also agree that they were highly inbred and that they suffered from that high genetic load too, right? Like you'd agree with Dr. Cardi now and myself that the evidence suggests that they were – Highly well, inbred, due to the isolation and then the inbreeding, of course. Yeah, Especially and I, uh, I uh, does uh, Walker. Do you know anything about this inbreeding thing? Okay, we found we found fossils. We got the DNA, mm -hmm. and the inbreeding is based on what? It's based on well, it's based on the DNA. So yeah, yeah, you can you can track like how much inbreeding there is based on the homozygosity um <laughs> within populations but all the the dna samples we have are from you know late surviving populations so we can't right. necessarily right. Okay. make assumptions from the early populations I just agree. because yeah. you know it all the so within the evolutionary time frame um all of our dna samples are from like thirty thousand years ago to about 70 or eighty thousand years ago and at that point, they were already coexisting and potentially experiencing pressures from Homo sapiens sapien, as well as um, that this is when the, the what is it called? The most recent glacial maximum. Or no, not the most recent glacial right. maximum, but this was an interglacial period, right? So they're already experiencing a more or less change of ecosystem uh, and less mm -hmm. megafaunal species to predate on, stuff like that. Um, and also another thing, I don't have a paper for this, but I remember reading it like a couple of years ago. Um, people theorize that the reason that our species became so prolific comparatively is because we have better social adaptation. So we know that Neanderthals lived in groups of like Smaller 10 group. to 12. Yeah, like mostly familial communities. And of course, when you're living with your family, who are you going to marry your cousin? Um, whereas early right. humans that were moving yeah. into Europe usually lived in groups of like 200 to 500, like fairly large, substantial tribes with a lot more gene flow. Yeah. Actually, um, I 100% agree with what you, I think that's a really good point that even I would like to emphasize more. Um, actually before, because I know uh, Speed likes kind of the sources. I, I, I am sharing screens, uh, Speed. I think you would have to probably approve it. Just a couple of the papers that suggest that they were highly inbred. But what Walker said is actually brilliant in that the sequences we have Thank you. seem to be of the later, um, I guess, existence of the Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. During the time when they were the probably the most inbred, during the time when they have the most recessive mutations that have come to the forefront. And because like, for example, this paper right here, I don't know if you shared screen or not, but where it says the Neanderthal genome included harmful mutations that made the hominids around 40% less reproductively fit than modern humans. Mm -hmm. This, like Walker said, probably was closer to their extinction versus closer to when they actually migrated and when they were at their best genetically, if, if one could say it that way. So I, I'd actually agree with him on, on that one. So it's, it's tough to say, how, you know, what were their genetics like prior to the extensive inbreeding and prior to the incredible loss in heterozygosity. So um, I'm, I'm actually going to emphasize that a little more, a little bit more. I'm glad you mentioned that Walker. Yep. Yeah. I, oh, well, you know, do you have any more points on this speed? Uh, I just, I, I, I'm just look, looking at that article that you, that, uh, yeah, that is a science direct article. It's not a paper. Well, it, it, yeah, it's it's based off uh, 
uh, I wonder if I got the paper in here. Let me see. I've got the paper saved as well that I can, if you want to read the whole paper, I can send that to you. Well, this is a, okay, this is an article. So the genetic cost of Neanderthal integration by Harris. So that's Harris uh, 2016. I think I have that somewhere. Do you, I, th I think you would. This I one is, I the introduction one I've got up here. Let me see. Let's see. I'm oh, looking for my, looking for my standing in poop fly file folder <laughs> <laughs> maybe it might, it might be right next to your collection of my 90 bucks yeah. uh, let's see well there's this one where uh, eric trinkos goes into it as well um, ah. you want to talk about that walker <laughs> i would love to talk about it oh, i'd trinkos. love to talk about it too it's danny i'm glad you brought this one up um so i've been meaning to do this for like the past week or so but i was looking it up and apparently eric trinkos is a professor at my university in a department that i'm involved in yes I remember <laughs> so, you saying that actually. Yeah, yeah. So I've been meaning to reach Don't out tell to, him about talk it. to him. I haven't yet. I haven't I yet. I was gonna say, oh no, my cover's up already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I definitely plan on doing that soon though, because I think that would just be an interesting conversation. And I need yeah. him in to find a a minor advisor as well. So interesting puts it nicely. <laughs> well, have you listened to any lectures by um I don't even know if I'm saying it right. I think so. Pabo, last name P A A B O. He's um a big influence in the paleo community when it comes to the Neanderthals. And mm -hmm. he's, he's got a lot of uh, um, interesting stuff to say on their DNA, oh. the out of Africa, the multi-regional. You can just YouTube or Google it, right? Pabo, mm -hmm. PABO yeah. Neanderthals, you'll find a ton of lectures on it. Um, but my guess, my prediction, when you talk to Eric Trinkos, he's going to admit that yes, where we see inbreeding in the fossil record, we also see pathology. We see, and and you know, Dr. Cardinal is right. That oftentimes, most of the time, we don't have the the genetics. We're lucky yeah. to have the genetics of the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. Yeah. Now we don't have the genetics of Homo floresiensis, Nelidi, Heidelbergensis, Erectus. Unfortunately, I I predict that if we do end up getting DNA from Erectus, it'll be pretty similar to Neanderthals, but. That's just a prediction. Well, he'll admit that you know we do see pathology. We do see because I know he examined some sequences of the Neanderthal right here that says they had higher levels of homozygosity, mm -hmm. implying pervasive inbreeding. At this point, I don't think there's anybody that disagrees that they weren't highly inbred. I know there was a point in time where people would dispute it. I don't think many do anymore. Um, here's your uh, genetic cost of Neanderthal introgression there, Speed. But my guess is, yeah, he, he would admit to the disease and the pathology and the fact that there's a lot, which seems, um, which, which, which is odd. You know, he says yeah. that it, it is odd that there's so much. But obviously, he's not going to hold to my overall conclusion. You know, mm -hmm. I've come to a different conclusion than he did. So, I mean, that would be, I think it's obvious that he would conclude that, but Walker, go ahead. What's your, what's your take on it? What's your take on Trinko's? Oh, well, I just, I don't think like, so I, I was his results, at least I haven't done a super in-depth study of this paper yet. Um, Here's the problem with Trinko's. But he, he concludes at least that the pathologies observed are due to a number of different factors. Inbreeding m probably, contributed to like a higher number of them, but also the fact that we know Neanderthals cared for their dead. Um, yes. The facts that, you know, if you don't die in a war and you're dying in a cave instead, you're more likely to be fossilized, right? right. right not fossilized, but subfossilized, I guess. That's not a word. But, you know, th there was a number of factors that also include societal factors of Neanderthals caring for their weak and all that kind of stuff that would have helped these uh, people with debilitating conditions still reach adulthood and stuff like that. Well, I'm glad you brought that up too. Like, what are your thoughts on the fact that if my screen's still shared, I mean, you can see in the last few decades, they've, the things you mentioned, bury their dead. We know that they interbred with humans, of course, but the mm -hmm. fact that they made music, musical instruments is pretty cool. Tools, cosmetics, jewelry, yep. um, purses. I got, I've read so many articles on Smithsonian how they go over all the many things that you're talking about and how they even use bones for weapons. They used um, stone tools for woodworking. Um, mm -hmm. I know you see that here. Let's see. Yeah. Research suggests they fashion tools, buried their dead. Maybe like I, I heard Dr. 
Rana, when he was debating Erica, he questioned whether or not they really did bury the dead. Mm -hmm. But we actually find Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans buried together, indicating yeah. that it was done intentionally. So what are your thoughts on somebody like Dr. Rana that would... Okay, I have let's, let's, uh, let's back the truck up back to Trinkhouse. Okay. <laughs> All the way to Trinkhouse. Okay. Hey, Trinkhouse. The is the one that brought up the Buried the Dead and got me. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry. Go I would there. like to talk about that. I think that's interesting, but okay. different time, different time. Okay. Is, it, is the truck back, back up, backed up now? Wait, beep, wait, okay. beep, beep. So what do they say about, what does Trinkhouse say about Neanderthals? Nothing. Oh, no, he okay. does. So, so, what? Yeah, he's right here. Let me see. I think it's Trinkos. Yeah, Eric Trinkos. Let's see. Do, do, do. Three Neanderthal sequences exhibit high levels of homozygosity, implying pervasive inbreeding among their ancestors. Um, the Neanderthals have also been characterized as having low genetic diversity overall relative to recent humans. So that's something Dr. Cardinal and I agreed on. So he does touch on the Neanderthals, probably because we only have Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA. The other pathology and disease, he's looking at just the bones themselves, deformities in the skull, the phalanges, things like that. Three Neanderthal sequences. The problem is I can't find that text in this paper. An abundance of developmental anomalies and abnormalities in the Pleistocene. You don't see that in the paper itself? Is that the abstract? Three Neanderthal. Because, okay, uh, three Neanderthal. No, it's not in the paper. The only mention it made in that paper on Neanderthals is in the uh, reference sections. There's some post Neanderthal genome. And, okay, what is your, what, what was your point in your book about putting this paper in there and say, you were trying to make the point that the fossils that we find are abnormal humans? Right? Is that correct? That's right. Yes. Okay. So the problem with that is this paper is not about fossils that are found in Africa. This paper by Trinkhaus is all in Europe. These are right. all Euro European fossils. And, and these are late fossils. These are these are places. Uh, mm -hmm. Pleistocene. Yeah, right? Pleistocene. That's right. Southwestern France. And we got, uh, I think, uh, where the hell we have here. So anyway, that has nothing to do with these fossils in Africa. So this this paper is not evidence of that. And I cannot find that Neanderthal quote. So where did that? So let's um, see if so we can figure out where that quote came from. I, I found it actually. So um, in the yeah, for some reason, yeah, Trinkhouse. If you were doing like a the search where you type in a word and you find it, uh, right. Trinkhouse spells Neanderthal throughout the paper without an H after the T. So that might have messed up your spelling. Okay, I'll dab. So it's a good and and How thank you, Walker. Oh, I've noticed yeah, a lot of people Neanderthal, Neanderthal. I don't think anybody really knows. I mean, they were discovered in Neanderthal Valley. So, or yeah. Neander Valley. So I guess that's why everybody gets confused over the tall or is it fall? Yeah. Um, so if you're doing it German, it would be Neanderthal, but spelled with a TH. Um, right. But it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, as long as you're, you know, so as long as people know what you're talking about. So okay, what we brought up was, was a good point and something worthy to address. Mm -hmm. So Trinkhaus points out throughout the paper that oftentimes the bones that are found to be old, of course, they'd be considered always finding them in the um, Pleistocene people are also riddled with pathology and disease. Now, the one the one thing fascinating that he points out that I that, that I personally find fascinating is that this he, he says that this pathology cannot be due to chance. There's just too much. So a lot of the bones that you look to, like, I mean, if you look to Homo floresiensis, of course, clearly diseased, clearly displaying pathology. Um, so this is just corroborate, like what you said about how they're not found in Africa. Right. That's precisely right. Because we know, according to the out of Africa scenario, and, and Dr. Cardinal and I talked about this um, quite extensively yesterday, mm -hmm. when modern humans migrated out of Africa, lo and behold, they met up with other people group, right? Neanderthals. Um, I believe Heidelbergensis or, or people, I know some people propose that Heidelbergensis evolved into Neanderthals independently, but it looks like that. that's why now they propose a first out of Africa migration with Erectus leaving, 
a subgroup of Erectus leaving and independently evolving into the other hominins in Eurasia, in Europe, for example. Yeah, From so my Denise Evans, yeah. Um, obviously, like your island, your islanders, like your, uh, your hobbits and the lady and then the newest one that they found. So, um, a lot of the hominins that I say are diseased and riddled with pathology and the bones are not transitional, the atypical nature of them are because they're pathological, are, yes, you're right, they're not found in Africa. And, mm -hmm. and I believe I make, I make that clear, but I also uh, point out the fact that your paleo experts agree that they've all, um, the way Erica and I always explain it, it's like Middle Earth if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, and you got all yeah. these different so-called species. Of, of homo living at the same time where many of them have actually, um, you know, have, have actually exchanged genetics. They've yeah. interbred, for example. And that's why, and, and I don't know if you want to answer this question now or later, but that's why I kept asking Dr. Cardi now, um, if, if Neanderthals were then, that means they were separated for about 400,000 years, roughly. While there is extensive genetic reshaping going on in Africa for Erectus to evolve into Homo sapiens before they migrated, met up with Neanderthals, and lo and behold, they produced healthy, fertile offspring. So how, how did they remain so interfertile with two independent genetic reshapings going on in Africa and then in Eurasia and Europe where the Neanderthals are found? Dr. Dan answered that a couple of times. There are, there are uh, I think he said there are some species that separated two million years ago. In order, in order for something to mate, all you need is the right number of chromosomes, and you need the you need an assemblage of the right genes to create a viable phenotype. And that is not uh, if there isn't a great deal of mutation or selected mutation in that two million years. There's no reason why two species with two million years separation could mate. There's, there's, uh, in fact, there could be very weird matings uh, between really diverse, well, not, not that diverse, but you know, like, like various bears and da, uh, can, uh, canids and uh, things of yeah. that nature. So hybridization is really weird, um, but I don't think 400,000 years, 400,000 years is a very long time. But as far as like evolutionary processes go and uh, interfertility and all that, that's really not that long. We have ligers, despite the fact that like lions and tigers diverged about three and a half million years ago. And did you see the uh, where the yeah, salmon and the paddlefish hybridized, which they have like a divergence from the Jurassic about a hundred about a hundred to one hundred twenty million years ago? You got to send me a paper on that because I, I thought it did. Oh, but it's crazy. Because I know a guy who did nothing but study. In fact, he works for our company as a programmer now. But his his uh, handle is Paddlefish. So that's all he did is Paddlefish at yeah. the University of Minnesota in mm. molecular biology. Anyway, uh, so back to Trinkos. So that is not evidence at all for any of the fossils found in Africa that, that those could be basically abnormal Which fossils humans. are you referring to in Africa? Uh, I don't know much about fossils in Africa. I'm going to have to defer to Walker on that. But uh, that, that <laughs> well, was your point. Ones, oh, wait a minute. That was your point, right? Because the ones right? I'm talking about. No, ones I'm talking, your... Okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, was that your point? That basically the fossils that we found in Africa that we can't get DNA out of, and I want to ask you a question about that. Uh, those fossils are the ones that are you, you are saying are abnormal humans, right? The, the uh, uh, what do you call it? The missing link species, you know, the the interim species or the connecting species. You're claiming that those were abnormalities, correct? I'm claiming that your mutant forms, like your hominins, like your Denisovans, your Neanderthals, your Hydrobergensis, Erectus, Nelidi, Homo floresiensis. These are the ones that are found outside of Africa. Now, Erectus is found inside Africa as well. But remember, there's that first out of Africa migration. Mm -hmm. The first out of two out of Africa's where Erectus left and then independently evolved into all your other hominins outside of Africa. So the, you, you find your hominins outside of Africa. That's why when, when modern Homo sapiens left and they had that genetic reshaping, that, that's why I understand what you're saying in, in the explanation as to why they remained interfertile, but it, it assumes the millions of years. We don't have to get into that. Yes. Two, the, the major genetic reshaping was literally from Homo erectus, 
a totally different species into modern Homo sapiens, which is a radical genetic changes. And yet when they met up with Neanderthals after 400,000 years, that's where the problem arises is that they still, now I could see if they produced offspring that were infertile, but the fact that they produced fertile offspring and we, we have two to 5% Neanderthal genetics, uh, genes in our genetics, that's where I, I find it problematic. But um, yeah, in, in regards to your uh, hominins that are found outside of, mm -hmm. outside of Africa, the paleo experts themselves agree that a lot of the bones and a lot of the atypical features, anomalous features, are the result of pathology and disease. So I'm just saying this corroborates, Trinkhouse's conclusions corroborate with my own conclusions regarding the out of Middle East um, event. Okay, just go, ahead, go ahead, I know I said a lot there, you guys did yeah. your time. Oh, you're good, but I, I just wanted to say, I don't think you can assume that there's a, ma like a massive genetic restructuring if we don't have the genome. And since we know that Good Neanderthals point. were like 99.7% similar or whatever, our common ancestor, assuming common ancestry, which I think we have pretty good reason to believe, um, would have had to have been somewhere in between. So they would have been more similar to us than Neanderthals because we've been evolving in separate directions for 400,000 years. So our most recent common ancestor, if we're saying it's Homo erectus, I believe it's a population of Homo is the current thought, but I don't know for sure. Um, it would have been probably like 99.85 instead of 99.7 or less than that, right? Because they've been right. going in opposite directions. Now, how, how much of the, so we've got their whole genome, essentially. We got their whole nuclear yeah, right. genome. We know their chromosomes. We got their mitochondrial DNA, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my point would be, okay, the fact that they are interfertile, the fact that they're still 99.7% uh, similar to modern um, Homo sapiens, and like I said earlier, your Erectus, your Hobbit, your Neanderthals, Denisovans, all these variants of what I say are just a single species, and, and the lumpers mm -hmm. versus the splitters would agree with that, that they were all just part of one big intermingling, interbreeding meta population. These, these facts and these data points that are agreed upon even by the paleo experts, for example, they are more consistent with the out of Babel, the out of Middle East theory, because they're only separated by about a thousand years or so. So this makes sense that they've all met up, they've interbred. Wait, 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 wait. Are only 99.7% similar. There's wait, no like far-fetched storytelling that, yeah, go ahead, Speed. What, what are your thoughts? You're still claiming that because they broke up 400, because they split 400,000 years ago, you're still claiming that they can't mate and we're saying that's not true. And I think Walker brought up, uh, what, what was it, tigers and lions? The fish. Yeah. Split three million years ago? Well, yeah, but, and the paddlefish and the sturgeons are and crazy. And, and, and that goes into a whole other separate topic and argument that, hey, listen. Okay, that, but, but it, basically you don't have a point. You don't have a point. felids really diverge hundreds of thousands of years ago, like is suggested just like with with the fish i think you said millions of years that's where it comes down to the millions of years issue is the, it's not like we for example all your domestic dogs canis domesticus they've all been what is there about 450 they've all been artificially selected from a couple of generic uh, probably wolves i think they say within the last um what is it a few thousand actually within a, a few thousand years or so um are they all interfertile are they, can they all interbreed, all your domestic dogs? Poodle, Great Dane, for example, or your, like- Genetically, dog. probably. Biologically, probably not. <laughs> because I, I would want, uh, for me to have a sufficient explanation and answer to that, I would wanna see something today that we know has split and diverged or even been selected for with your breeds within even the line in human lifetime, recorded lifetime. And let's see if, if they can interbreed, for example. And then we don't have to assume the millions of years. So if we could prove that all of these 450 breed dogs can interbreed and produce fertile offspring, then you might have a bit of a point there, you know what I mean? But just going to some divergence between uh, types of fish and uh, what was the other example you used with, with the cats? Well, that's just yeah. assuming the millions of years. Let's, let's look at something. Well, let's, the let's, let's, wait, 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 wait. Let's assume 6,000 years then. Okay, we came out of Africa 6,000 years ago. They, uh, Neanderthals came out of Africa 6,000 years ago. 
Who cares about millions of years? So we mutated faster. Okay, you want to get to you can't just, you can't just use your six thousand year timeline. You have to prove that in another another thread in another talk before you can use that. You can't. We, we are talking about okay. We're presenting to you our model, and we're telling right. you that in our model there is no problem with two million years apart and something mating. And we're telling you that is the case because of genetics, because of molecular genetics, not because of any assumption of two mil of millions of years. It has nothing to do with millions of years. Okay. Well, let, um, that's a good point. You years that's, a good point you, that's a good point you brought up. Just, just so we at least have enough time to discuss that then, since we've touched on a lot of good topics. I know Walker and I would, could probably talk for hours about the fact <laughs> that Neanderthals buried their dad and yeah. we could talk about Trinkos forever. I'm curious, but Walker, when you talk to Trinkos, I'm very interested in his, in, in his thoughts. Okay. And um, what he thinks about young Earth creationists, you know. <laughs> I'm I'm curious curious about that too. <laughs> Let's see if my prediction pans out. That you know, I'm sure he's going to have a totally different conclusion. Yeah. But, yeah. We, we, we don't have to be in a hurry, standing because I, I'm 69 years old, and uh, my great grandma lived to 106 in 1956. So that gives me like 37 <laughs> years. And for 37 years, I am going to do nothing but concentrate on you. And Rob Matt and John Maddox. Okay. I love it. Yep. It, it, it um, keeps me busy too. Yeah. You know, it, it's fun. We're battling each okay. other. James Donard, James Donard injected a question, which I think oh, is no. really when you said lumpers and what, what were the other ones? Lumpers and uh, splitters. Splitters, right. Who are the lumpers who agree with you? So is the lumpers. The lumpers are the ones, for example, let me go over back here. The lumpers are the ones that oftentimes, are you familiar with the bone pits where they've discovered, um, well, I don't have the reference in front of me, but a lot of different bones, but th I think it was either three or four skulls that exhibited variation consistent with Neanderthals, anatomically modern humans, uh, Erectus, and Heidelbergensis. And the lumpers, because they're all found in the same bone pits, where it looked like they intermingled and interbred, the interbred was uh, more of an inference. But the lumpers concluded, okay, they're found in the same spot. The variation overlaps. Therefore, they lump them all into the Homo neanderthalensis category, even though we've seen variation of the other three species. So with the lumpers, they'll take, let's say, anything that has kind of the variation of like Arachnus, Neanderthal, they'll lump them into one category. Now, they'll consider them subspecies, Right, Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens subspecies Homo neanderthalensis, for example. Mm -hmm. Homo sapiens subspecies. Oh, can I ask something real quick? Yeah, hang on a, hold on a second. Are okay. you talking about the Spanish cave with the Neanderthal? Uh, the well, bone pits, pit, pit of bones. There's, the, there's been a few of them. I, I can find the reference here if you want. Let me see. We do. Well, um, I'll, I'll find. I'll find. I'll find it. There's we're been a few. Right? There's we're all been about references. Well, okay. What's well, so an off top? I don't have every single reference in front of me, but yeah. Go, okay. Go James ahead. says you can't name the scientist, can you? <laughs> oh, I can name the. I can name the scientist. For example, Pabo. What I was talking about. He he concludes that Homo neanderthalensis is a subspecies. He. What, what, where's the quote? Well, how, how do you spell his okay. name? So the whole idea. Here's something that Dan was talking about the other day. The whole idea of species doesn't really work biologically. It's more lineage. Like I could find a lumper who would group us with genus Pan, right? Like call us Pan sapiens, and, and that doesn't mean that like we're we're still an independent lineage. Okay. And economically, that's valid, right? I I didn't know that. You, is there really lumper? I'm not I'm not opposed to it, but are there some lumpers that go that far? Yeah. Yeah, there's argument. There's people who argue that we should be grouped with chimpanzees and bonobos, but not, I can't say I'm surprised. But yeah, the lumpers oftentimes do go yeah. well. It's like with what you're what you're saying here, um, where it says has led some anthropologists to claim Homo neanderthalensis should be considered a subspecies of Homo sapiens rather than a separate species. Yeah, those would be your, your splitters are just looking at any little bit of morphological variation and claim it's a different species. But it's it's kind of hard with the fossil record because as Dr. Cardinal said, we don't have the genetics. And yeah. we know that there's a lot of overlapping variation. Yeah, he's, yeah. You know, I have a question yeah, there. This guy has a chin, but he's also got the, he's got the, if, if just that skull cap of him 
was fossilized and we didn't have the actual chin and everything else to corroborate with it, they may conclude that this is, uh, you know, more of a, a homo neanderthalensis. So with with fragmented bones and no genetics, well, sometimes wait, it's wait, wait, wait. So are you saying that not having the complete, like, skeleton of a, uh, or like the complete fossil of a, um, like, of subhuman species are insufficient to categorize them as different species or... No, well, I mean, that's why there's the type specimen, right? The one that they compare all the other finds to, to conclude, you know, what species does this belong to? But a lot of times you do find isolated bones, like just skull caps, where they say, okay, this, this um, morphology seems to be most consistent with Homo neanderthalensis. Therefore, this, and then they compare it to the type specimen, therefore conclude. So a lot of times, yeah, it's just, like, if you look at a, a full skeleton of a Neanderthal or... I mean, you name any one of the hominids. Oftentimes, especially with the Australopithecines, it's all isolated bones where they think it's the same creature that they've reconstructed. But oftentimes, the reconstructions are just from a bunch of isolated, fragmented bones that they can oftentimes reconstruct accurately. I'm not against that. But when you just find a skull cap in isolation, like if you found his skull cap in isolation, I mean, you're not going to, you're probably not going to put him in the category of homo sapiens. I mean, Walker, what do you think? You seem to be up to date on this. Uh, with respect to what, sorry? Well, just with the... Um, Should they be a, one? A, a lot of the isolated bones that they find. Like, they oftentimes find... Like, if they find an isolated skull cap, for example, and it has uh, more morphology consistent with a homo neanderthalensis versus, like, a homo sapiens, oh. they may designate that homo neanderthalensis. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, okay, so if you dig something out of the ground and it's not super characteristic, you can usually assign, like, a general area. Like, it, so if someone pulled out a femur out of the ground, it's going to be roughly the same from Homo sapiens sapiens to Homo neanderthalensis, right? So at that, they probably wouldn't try to designate a species. But if they found a skull cap or a jaw fragment or something like that, then, yeah, they would probably consider that valid enough to designate into uh, Homo neanderthalensis. If you guys want to make a few more points, I am going. I'm looking for the pit of bones that he's. Yeah, the pit of bones and the name so. name of that pabo or whatever. We we want that. Oh. Did I spell that right? Can you oh. spell it for me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, I believe. See, there's been many. The one that I'm specifically referring to is. Um, I believe the variation seen in it was Neanderthal directus, I think Homo sapiens for sure, and I think Heidelbergensis, but it was in 1992. Um, the team was led by Juan Luis Arsuaga. The pit of bones, I believe, Tima de los Huesos. I'm probably butchering that. Can, but can, you, put those, can okay. you put those in chat so we have yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Oh, yeah, by the way, I've been any paper I've mentioned, I've put it in the private chat. Um, okay, let me do that right now. You guys, you guys keep talking and me, and then hopefully we can get to the hyper mutating because it seems like that would be the biggest point of contention. I definitely want to be yeah. around for, well, okay, go ahead as I type this in. Okay. Well, I was just going to say my biggest point of contention is kind of related to this, but I, I don't think whether you want to lump them or split, like lump them into the same species or split them species on species basis is kind of irrelevant as to whether Neanderthals are an outgroup, right? So even if you find someone who lumps them within Homo sapiens, they would still be considered an outgroup to all living Homo sapiens. Well, I mean, what's your de what's your best definition of? Because it's it's so weird. Because Dr. Cardinal, from all the people that I've debated and discussed with, and the people that I've even heard Ken Hoven debate, they always define species in a way that would suggest all your a lot of your hominids would have to be hominins, I should say, would have mm -hmm. to be one species. But now Dr. Uh, Stern Cardinal, now he he admits that the species term, the idea of species is arbitrary. Yeah. And yeah. therefore now he doesn't have to lump them in together. But well, he, see, he almost seemed like an exception to the rule from just my experience, though. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. No, like, what would be your best definition of species? No, we don't talk about species so much as uh, clades and, and, and relationships. Yeah. So I, I think the, the concept of species, in, at least in the way that we define it, is very centric on us, right? Clades get smaller and smaller as you get closer to us. You know, you start with like I, I recently found a paper, you know, um, two, two species within the coelacanth genus Latimeria are separated by 40 million years. 
And the, there's one species, the Indonesian coelacanth, with two subpopulations that are separated by 13 million years, right? If we're going by that, then we should be the same species as gorillas. You know, it, as you get closer to Homo sapiens, the requirement for something to be designated as a species shrinks, like dramatically. Um, so I think the, the concept of species, it's useful for so that we know what we're talking about. But that's not as important as the lineage itself and where that lineage diverged from other lineages that are related. Right. Um, so what uh, I, I typed it in. I'm pretty sure this is the one. I've got a ton of sources here. I believe that's the one. Look it up. And there should be, let me see. It's, it says, Stringer decided to classify all the diverse skeletons as Neanderthals. And he, he said, let me see, in spite of all the variation they display, they get sucked in with the Neanderthal. Once that happens, it becomes very difficult to pre prevent the rest of the European material from getting sucked in as well. Mm -hmm. And that is lumping in, yeah, like I said, Arachnus, Heidelbergensis, Neanderthals, Homo sapiens. That's just one bit of the uh, pit of bones. But the, the, the fact, like, for example, like you were saying earlier, though, even just considering, yeah, species are good to a point, slightly arbitrary. But you, like you were bringing up earlier, Walker, with the fact that uh, their fire use, their hunting, their burial of the dead, their obvious evidence for spirituality, the fact that we interbred with them. I mean, mm -hmm. my position that is they're just a human variant. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I would agree with that. Fetched. Like, what, what's your, like, you know, just just given everything we know about them from different lines of evidence in different fields, is that, because if they were living today, I'd almost be uncomfortable pointing at a Neanderthal and saying, hey, you're a different species. I mean, everything we see regarding them seems they were they were spiritual beings. They were, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Would you be comfortable saying, hey, you're a different species if they're alive today, just yeah. as you would be comfortable looking at them in the fossil record and saying, hey, you're a... Um, cool. Different species. Go ahead, Walker. I, I think if they were alive today, our definition of Homo sapien would be broader, right? We would include okay. their lineage yeah. within Homo sapiens. Um, I, I think they would fit most definitions as a human variant. But like I said, that that's kind of obfuscating the point that they are an outgroup to any living humans. Like we're closer related to the Khoisan people, which are generally considered the the most genetically distinct, right? Yes. So we're closer to Khoisan people than anybody would be to Neanderthals. Neanderthals are not part of any known mitochondrial haplogroup within our clade, right? They're, they're a lineage that diverged before right. our last common ancestor. Do you know, like, what's the max amount of mitochondrial DNA differences that separate, let's say, but uh, us, non-Africans, non-Bushmen, as you can say, like the Khoisan, yeah. what would be the maximum that separate, let's say me and you, Walker? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> Probably pretty small because we'd both be in haplogroup L2, I believe, which is pretty tiny. I'm going to I'm gonna post a lecture. You guys okay. would really enjoy it. It's okay. It's let me see. I got it right here. It says what DNA says. It's not creations or anything like that. Don't worry. It says what DNA says about our human family. Episode two, ancient relatives, Neanderthals, Denise events. He goes, I think he does seven examples where the average between any two like humans is about seven mm -hmm. versus the Neanderthals, I think is, I'm going to post it in the chat so you can watch. I've only watched it once. I did make some notes, but I think it was about 30, yeah. which means according to evolution. Yeah. The differences reflect, you know, like that, that, that nested hierarchy, for example, we are more similar. We have, uh, fewer differences with the chimpanzee than we do with the old world monkeys because of time of divergence. You know, yeah. we share a more recent common ancestor with the chimpanzee than we would with an old world monkey, than we would with a dog and a fish. So those differences, that's why they oftentimes look at those highly conserved mitochondrial DNA proteins, which natural selection preserves because they're important, important functional roles. Therefore, those differences seem to be consistent with times of divergence consistent with the nested hierarchy of evolution. So you're saying the Neanderthals were more similar to the Khoisan peoples and the Africans than we are to the, ne the Neanderthals. Therefore, we share more of a uh, common ancestor, obviously, with the Africans in the out of Africa scenario than we do with the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals go even further back than 
uh, non-Africans, Africans, and Neanderthals. Is that more or less uh, correct? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's right. Um, but I, I think one minor confusion is the fact, it's not just the number of differences, it's what those specific differences are. Yeah, it's the right? genetic markers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the single nucleotide polymorphisms, right? So right. if our, you know, 100th great ancestor had a specific mitochondrial mutation, they would have passed it down to all subsequent descendants, if it's not subject to uh, mu or selection pressures, obviously. But so what we're looking at are, so we have single nucleotide polymorphisms on Neanderthal genomes that are in that are also held in common with chimps, but not with us, right? And the chances that that would just be a back mutation are very small. And the fact that they're so frequent throughout the genome it makes the, the p-value like infinitesimally high. We, we would have to have a z-score of like thousands for them to not be nested outside of us. Right, so you, now the single nucleotide polymorphisms, actually for what you said with the divergions, you're right, mm -hmm. it, it's not the amount of differences, it's it's the genetic markers that would more so differentiate, the, you know, the. the the genetic markers is the best way to put it. So you did explain it. Um, you did explain it good there. The SNP. So right now you're looking with the genetic markers you're specifically looking at. Are you looking in the nuclear DNA or the mitochondrial DNA? Okay. So I was looking for a paper earlier today. I didn't have that much time to look for papers. I was kind of busy today, but I did find one, but it, it focuses on nuclear DNA more so than mitochondrial DNA. Um, but I think it still shows the point speed. Could you share the screen real quick? Uh, yeah. Um. Okay, so can everyone see that? Yeah. Let's see, yep. where is, uh, I got to find out how to shut down RJ's. Okay, got it. Yeah, so this is mostly just a graphic. It's from a paper. I can link the paper. Um, but this is just, you know, four bases from the gene HAN or HACNS1. I don't know what it does. Um, but a as you can see from the graph, I didn't mean to click on that. As you can see from the graph, the chimps share a uh, on position four a base in common with Neanderthals, but not with humans, right? And so there's let's just say a one in three chance, assuming all mutations are equally likely on that spot. There's a one in three chance that they would have a back mutation towards what the chimps have, right? And, and if we find twenty of them, it would be one in three to the twentieth power that the chances of all of these being back mutations. The chances of that happening are just non-existent. So here's, and I, I like how you're up to date on all this, Walker. It makes it fun to talk to. So I'll give you Thank a compliment you. for that. Now, I try my best. Because, because we're looking at the nuclear DNA, though, mm -hmm. and you've heard me say this before, that means created heterozygosity would apply. And that means since Neanderthals would have had millions of created differences, when we're looking at the differences that the evolutionists assume are all the result of mutations over time, millions and millions of years of mutation. Therefore, according to, as you know, the created heterozygosity model, we would still predict some form of nested hierarchical patterns in the DNA. So it makes it kind of difficult in the nuclear DNA versus the mitochondrial DNA, which is a lot smaller. It's only about, what is it, 16,000 letters long or so. Um, and it's consistent because it's uniparentally inherited. You know what I mean? It's not biparentally inherited where you're subject to recombination and all of this, all of this mess. So are you pretty much pointing to kind of like a hierarchical pattern in the distribution of the SMPs and the rarity of, of back mutations occurring to be consistent with that? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I the the back work okay, okay, so I'm just trying to say that the single nucleotide polymorphisms are the SMPs are more closely correlated with a pattern that places Neanderthals as an outgroup to Homo sapiens than right. nested within Homo sapiens. Right, right. And so, I will admit, I wish I had a, oh, I was just gonna say, I was trying to find a paper on mitochondrial DNA. I could not find one. If I find one, I'll definitely send it to you. Because Dan's biggest problem is, is, is the nesting, of course, but mm -hmm. also the hypermutation hypothesis where he believes, and, and I, I believe you're in accord with that, that the hypermutation hypothesis is inconsistent with what we know about the inbreeding nature 
of the Neanderthals and the low, low levels of heterozygosity. So there's a lot of homozygosity in the Neanderthal nuclear genome. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's where they discovered the homozygosity and the evidence for inbreeding was in the nuclear genome, from my understanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you agree with that? Is that kind of what you found too? Yeah, yeah, I would agree that that's one of the problems. Um, I, I no, think I'm, I'm saying, would you agree that it's the, the nuclear genome itself being so vastly larger than the mitochondrial uh, DNA compartment? That's where we find the most significant evidence for the inbreeding and oh. the levels of homozygosity. I do not have any papers, so I can't say yes, but that seems like it would be accurate because nuclear DNA is diploid. So, um, but okay. I don't know. So the hypermutating hypothesis, uh, because it, it seems like this was the major contention of the debate itself, that the hypermutating hypothesis is inconsistent with the inbreeding nature of the Neanderthals because hyper mutation would lead to more genetic diversity. And yet we know the Neanderthals are less genetic diverse. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yep. Summary is good. Right. <clears throat> so why do you believe that that what like, so I, I think I reiterated it good, but do you guys want to expand on it a little bit and explain why you believe that there's, uh, <laughs> there's no way to, um, combine the two or, or show any consistency with the two, like the, the, the four is yours. If you want to, I'm, I'm curious, just you know, give me your thought. Cause that seems like that's the major point of contention is, Hey, listen, you, you can't combine the two. They're mutually exclusive is, is what D- Dan Cardinal was saying. Yeah. yeah pretty uh, hyper mutation is going to lead to a, a highly heterozygous population basically a diverse population, and that isn't what we saw in Neanderthals. So there was no indication that there was hypermutation. There was indication that there was inbreeding, which would end up with uh, a lot of homozygous alleles. So that is the point. Those two things don't go together. And the other thing is you kept misunderstanding Dan when he said diverging, that they diverged. You kept thinking he was talking about diversity. And he may have used the wrong word at some point. I haven't got the transcript yet, but he was talking about divergence, not diversity. Okay, diversity is what you would get if you had a hypermutating population, like Lenski's bacteria. A lot of a lot of the strains were hypermutating. So, anyway, so the two things don't go together. You're you're claiming that they broke off in just a few hundred years. Mm-hmm. That they broke off and they hyper mutated into Neanderthals. Of course, you have your epigenetic rescue device, but it just doesn't make any sense. And the other problem with it is that Dr. Dan was trying to tell you that if there was a common ancestor, uh, if if the common ancestor were, were was the human branch that you're looking at, then the genetic markers from the human branch would have had to be lost on the Neanderthal branch. And then we would have to gain our own genetic markers after the split, after Babel or uh, right, right before Babel. And none of that made any sense. And that was a problem that Dr. Dan was having is that he knows how genetics works. And you don't seem to be quite aware of how genetics works in detail. You haven't gone into sufficient detail in your studies to figure out that what you were saying didn't hash out. Okay. And, th- and that's where you two were fighting last night okay so and i did hear everything i appreciate all that and i think you were uh, incredibly detailed which is good so it gives us something to work with now would you also agree with walker and i that well you know what since i'll, I'll address it one by one so you said i misunderstood the divergence wait 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 you said walker and i in one like together <laughs> yeah. walker because <laughs> Walker and I were agreeing that you're. Oh, and also, if you don't provide all your sources, I'm going to sick, sick R- RJ on you. <laughs> are you going to stick that uh, mouse on me that your cat just brought in? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and game and served. Okay, so the army of raccoons. Diversity is 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 different than divergence, and and I un- I understood that right off the bat. Now the thing is. What was confusing and what seemed to be conflating unintentionally was how he was saying the hypermutating hypothesis then leads to the prediction 
from our side, if it's true, that there should be higher levels of genetic diversity. Right. Mm -hmm. so that's why I was saying, hey, are you going back on your claim now that we would predict higher le levels of genetic diversity? In because man. my claim, so the divergence, I understand. I would expect there to be some divergence between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, given their, uh, get, given the genetic reshaping that has occurred in the thousands of years since, um, well, since the Neanderthals went extinct, for example, the divergence pretty much just between the two groups tells us how different the two groups are from one another. And I understand, but he kept saying it's his main point seemed to be, listen, we know. Neanderthals have low genetic diversity. Therefore, that's inconsistent with your hypermutation mutation hypothesis. I disagreed with that. It turned out that we both agreed that the Neanderthals are highly inbred. Yeah. Therefore, the next question is, if they really were hypermutating to account for the mitochondrial DNA differences that um, make it appear that they're... because. They seem when you when you put when you pull it up on a phylogenetic chart, they seem to branch off heavily from the African. The, the, their branches are even longer than the African branch. That's how many more differences they have than we do. So our biggest disagreement, since we agreed with the inbreeding, our biggest disagreement is how do you incorporate the hypermutation into the the, the inbreeding? So that that's where the but I understood what he meant by diversity. Oh, how, do you, how do you incorporate that? So. Do, before we, this is where I would see if you agree with Walker and I. Do you agree that the, the nuclear DNA itself is where we find a lot of the levels of homozygosity and the evidence for inbreeding? Yep. Yep. Right. Yeah. right. So here's the thing. You're not going to get homozygous uh, mitochondrial RNA or DNA. <laughs> right. Right. Or single okay. speed. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. So here's the thing. Okay. The best way I can put it, and this is kind of, unfortunately near the end, we got away from the 90 second increments, which is okay. I think we're going to have a second discussion where it's just on this question, but the hypermutation would have a big effect on, let's say your mitochondrial DNA, your Y chromosome, because those are uni parentally inherited DNA, as we would agree. The mitochondrial DNA, we, we inherit almost exclusively from our mothers. Y chromosome from our fathers. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. The <laughs> biparentally inherited DNA, though, as we were talking about earlier, which is the nuclear DNA, recombined, for example, created heterozygosity would now apply. As, I, as me and Walker were talking about earlier, Neanderthals would have had millions of created differences what this means is the corresponding increase due to the hypermutation would be virtually undetectable in the nuclear DNA because, because of the uh, incredible amount of inbreeding. But by far, Speed, the greatest impact would be, as I said, due to the levels of inbreeding. That means it's entirely plausible to have biparentally inherited DNA be less diverse, which we agreed with. We spent most of the, the debate on that, but we agreed with it. And yet the less diverse than modern humans, we should say, say let's be correct. But the uniparentally inherited DNA to be more diverse, which is the mitochondrial DNA, which is where we need the hypermutation to have the most significant impact because that's where the DNA differences are that cannot be attributed to created heterozygosity and that are corresponding to the most recent common ancestor of modern uh, people groups. So what are your thoughts on that? Go ahead. Well, okay. So you said that they would have been front loaded with uh, allelic diversity and stuff like that. In the but we, DNA, yeah, yeah, in the nuclear DNA. But we still have DNA samples from Homo sapiens from that time period, right? And we still don't see them as an in group. Um, right, and that's a problem. Yeah, and, and another thing is, yeah, but you're looking at so, created heterozygosity. So you're looking at nuclear DNA markers because because now we're talking about the mito. So are you saying the mitochondrial DNA? Because I want to know why you believe that the hypermutation is inconsistent. I, I get what you're saying about the, the phylogeny, the phylogenetics, where they... Yeah, now. well, that was right a separate you, point, but yeah. Yeah, so, so just the hypermutation. Why do you believe that they are inconsistent with each other? Because, as I said, the inbreeding would be your greatest effect in the nuclear DNA. Okay. The hypermutation would be almost undetectable. 
But yet the mitochondrial DNA, which is only 16,000 letters long, this is where there would be the most significant impact. And therefore, both can be consistent. Yes, you have hypermutation in the whole genome, of course. Of course, you have hypermutation in the whole genome. But the nuclear DNA, the size of it, the recombination that occurs in it, combined with our position of created heterozygosity, those mutations would be virtually undetectable, but not undetectable in the mitochondrial DNA. So that's how they both can, Dr. Dan says they're, they, they have to be mutually exclusive, when in fact that's not the case. And I'm glad that we ended up agreeing that the inbreeding is, um, is observed. But yeah. now we have to go into the mitochondrial DNA, and that's where the hypermutation is going to have the most significant impact. So, like, what would be your objections to that? So how okay. long? Okay, you think the Neanderthals split off four four thousand two hundred years ago from from Adam and Eve, the Adam and Eve line, or the Noah line? Okay, so it, uh, when did they go extinct? The Neanderthals? Yeah. So they would have went extinct. So you, uh, like I said, my position on the Neanderthal is a little bit different than the other hominin. So it would have been pre babel okay? So they split off. They adapted to your ice age related conditions, har harsh environmental conditions. But what I, what I say about the Neanderthals being closer to the initial flood event and creation, their genomes at that time, kind of like Walker said, the genomes we're looking at now, the sequences we have now, they are kind of nearing the end of the Neanderthal's existence, probably a time where they had the most inbreeding, the most mutational load, you know, when, when was that? When, when was that? How long did the Neanderthals last after they split from the, uh, Noah lineage? It's, it's a good question. But so if, if they were close, if, yes. if they split off closer to the creation event and the flood event at that point, which I don't believe we have their genetic sequences as, as Walker and I agreed about their genomes would have been less, um, their genomes would have been more heterozygous, less mutational low. They wouldn't have had incredible inbreeding. The inbreeding occurred after the migration pre babel and the accelerated genetic degeneration would have occurred for one. You've got superior genomes that are now uh, experiencing harsh environmental conditions combined with the uh, with the inbreeding itself, bringing to the forefront lots of genetic mistakes. So that would have happened rapidly. It would have been rapid accelerated genetic degeneration. How many years exactly? So pre babel um, the flood 4,500 years ago, probably within a, a 1,500 years or so after the flood. So that would, okay. So, But if they split off, okay, the flood was 4.4, .4, so 4.2. So if they lasted for 1,300 years, let me grab a pen too. We're at five point seven thousand years now, where they went yeah, extinct. That's only two thousand nine hundred years ago that you're claiming the Neanderthals went extinct. So let's see. So we got just wait. Let, let, I'll, I'll do the. So we got forty five hundred years since the flood. Okay. No, actually, you said they split off like. Right, right, yeah, yeah. I'm four, just. Four, I'm going to start writing it down to, instead of just kind of throwing guesses out there. So we got four forty five hundred years since the flood. Let's say another five hundred to Babel. Which means uh, Neanderthals, let's say 45,000. How many years did you say? 2,200? They've probably been extinct for about 3,500 years. Uh, wait, wait, that only well, that means they have 700, 700 years, to, years to, to live and mutate. Since the flood, 4,500, they branch off within the next 300 years. Mm -hmm. It's, it's tough to say because a lot of like, even the paleo experts will agree, like your um, like Floresiensis, once you get those, that small tribe, that population that's in, that's inbred due to founder effects, uh, inbreeding depression, for example, rapid mm. genetic decline can happen quick. So I don't know how rapid it happened, but I always use this example. You guys don't have the assumption of uh, superior genomes, of course, so that's fine. But I always use the example that if I'm on a purely alkaline diet and I haven't had McDonald's or fast food in years, okay, for example, and then all of a sudden my body's not used to the, that chemical garbage and I start going, like if you've ever seen the movie Super Size Me, that guy had McDonald's three times a day for a few months and he declined rapidly. That yeah. Imagine the Neanderthals, which had some it, it is brow ridge grand shop. Okay. <laughs> I think if the brow ridge was prior. Right. I, I do have a I do have a question. So I mean, are are you claiming like that the primary source of genetic deterioration would have been due to like excessive inbreeding within the population? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, it it accelerated because 
like Walker said, the sequences we have now would have been at a point where the Neanderthals were the most inbred and genetically compromised. But I don't okay. believe they were originally like that. So yeah, the, the most of it would have been harsh environmental conditions combined with the inbreeding, which brings the, because Dan is right, inbreeding itself doesn't really increase the mutation rate. It just brings recessive mutations to the forefront. Now there are some deleterious mutations uh, that are disease causing that I, that I was reading about that if they come to the forefront, they can as a result increase mutation rates, but this is an exception to the rule. So the, yeah, so environmental conditions uh, combined with the inbreeding would have resulted in the rapid, rapid decline. Okay, so that brings me to the kind of second point of like what, and, and I don't know, like maybe this is still a, an, an area of interest like within creationist research, but what kind of like selective pressure, well not selective pressure, but what kind of environmental pressure would have encouraged like them to continuously interbreed with each other? I mean, once they reach the significant population, I mean, you would think, okay, they're probably going to go out, do their own thing, you know, maybe you start doing hunting, hunting, gathering tribes or whatever, right. you know, not continuously breed with one another, like with local people groups. Okay, so what selective pressures? I, I just I want to make sure I'm not like misrepresenting your question. So, yeah, so what, like, so what yeah, and or selective pressures would have caused them like to continuously interbreed with each other? Oh, what's, okay. Well, it, it seems from what we know, and and from what I've read in in the um, literature and uh, and what paleo experts are saying that they um existed in small tribes as hunter gatherers so it seems like it, it had to do with the neanderthals their their cultural way their way of just being in small isolated groups so the selective pressure is probably being the fact that they uh were hunter gatherers had to live in in caves for example so yeah they were robust they were well adapted but it seems like when the modern homo sapiens came in the evolution the uh, paleo experts say the the modern homo sapiens were not as robust but or well adapted but they had higher intelligence and therefore you know like your neanderthal may look like your cavemen because they were skilled in some areas and not skilled in others. So I think just their hunter gatherer nature would have um, resulted in them uh, existing in, in small tribes. But I, I mean, we don't have every answer and I don't even think the paleo, because anytime I watch these lectures, they always say, Hey, we know so little, <laughs> which is, which is fine. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's, no. it's, it's something, I mean, obviously we don't have a time machine to go back and tell, but it's, it's just an interesting thing to consider. Trying you know. our best. Um, we are, we are. I want to say it, it's been an hour and a half. My wife's like, "Hey, when are we going to watch the movie?" Because you, this has been so respectful. You guys have been so good. Before I leave, though, um, why don't you guys just kind of give give the last words, give some critiques? I won't even respond to it, and then th that'll feel like it's, I think, fair for everybody. Like, what what are your thoughts on um, how I? explain um because I, I truly do believe and and we're going to touch on this in our next discussion uh, me and dr stern cardinal i'm glad that we agree with the inbreeding the mm -hmm. big the biggest thing to take away when you watch that debate is we disagree that the uh, low genetic diversity is not consistent with the hyper mutation and i and i think i have a plausible explanation as to why they are consistent but you guys have the last words you've been respectful this has been fun and i'll just kind of sit back and listen and write things down and kind of go from there okay um wait before we do that <laughs> i did have a question about like your model and stuff right okay yeah yeah so yeah. this is this is a legitimate question because i don't have any papers and i don't know what the support for this is um, but how do the mitochondrial genome sequences compare from disparate populations of Neanderthals and how does that compare to their nuclear pop or their nuclear genomes, right? So like if you have a Neanderthal genome from France and a Neanderthal genome from like Northern Russia, what would the, the differences be between those two mitochondrial DNA versus their nuclear DNA? Right. Good. You okay. Know? Yeah. Good question. I'm writing that. So we've got Neanderthal, let's say DNA from where? Russia? Yeah, let's just say like two as far as you can get into the Neanderthal range. Okay, so like Siberia and um, Spain or something. Spain, yeah, and then that's kind of the example I gave with Dan. I said, listen, I do believe that it's reliable because we get such consistent results. You get DNA from Siberia, <laughs> DNA from Spain, and they seem to line up and still group them all together. You'd think that they would be grouped all over the place; it'd be a mess, but it seems to be consistent. So your question is, how does mtDNA compare? 
with these two samples in different areas on the planet, obviously, with mm -hmm. the nuclear DNA. Mm -hmm. mm. um, probably pretty consistent. It, it seems like because I think they I think Pabo watch that lecture. OK, actually, I'm going to give you another lecture from from Pabo. It seems like I think they did a, a thousand. They did a thousand sequences or a, a thousand different people and variants to test. And it seems like on average, it's about 30 differences with the mitochondrial DNA. With the with the nuclear DNA, it's all pretty similar as well. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you were pointing out with the SNPs. If, if I said consistent or similar, like what, what would you think about that? Because I don't know, I gotta, I gotta look to, to know exactly. But Yeah, well, I, I'm just wondering because that, that's kind of a prediction that your model would have to make, right? So if you have, if you're saying that the nuclear DNA can't be used to confer ancestry, because I, I agree, it's usually worse than mitochondrial DNA, but it's not impossible to confer ancestry using nuclear DNA. No, it's not. Um, so let's say if you have these two disparate populations, your theory would predict that their mitochondrial sequences would be extremely different because they still have the hypermutation, but their nuclear se sequences would be really similar. And right, I right. don't know... I, my, my personal like intuitive guess, I don't know, science isn't ever intuitive. My intuitive guess would be that the nuclear DNA and the mitochondrial DNA would show roughly the same amount of differences, but I don't know, and that's something I'll have to look at. I, I think mtDNA would show less out of necessity unless you're looking oh, of course, at yeah. Well, I mean, like, relative. relative. Well, with, nuclear, with nuclear DNA today with modern homo sapiens, I mean, we're looking at between, like, 60 to 100 per generation, per person per generation. So there's a lot more mutations getting through in the germ cell line in the nuclear DNA. Mitochondrial DNA, like Speed said, is a lot, lot less, which makes sense because it's only 16,000 letters long. And with the important and functions it, that are encoded by mitochondrial right. DNA proteins, typically natural selection works better on mitochondrial DNA because you get a mutation in, in uh, you know, a mito your mitochondrial DNA that affects the heart. I mean, you're gonna die. Natural selection is gonna weed you out real quick. So I would say, uh, I would say consistency, nuclear DNA across the board is going to show high levels of homozygosity, which seems to be the case. Mm -hmm. And mitochondrial DNA is going to show um, consistent results, probably um, 30 or so differences. Um, you can watch those lectures and, and see. I'm going to rewatch them. But the uh, point is it, we need hypermutation in mitochondrial DNA. Because, because remember, the, the, here's the underlying issue. This is where Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal's problem is, is we use pedigree-based studies on modern sap homo sapiens today. We use the empirical method um, and we track it back to about 6,000 years. But his criticism is once you throw Neanderthals in there, ancient DNA, suddenly it's all out of whack because, um, because of how many differences they have versus modern homo sapiens. So that's where the hypermutating hypothesis comes in to explain the mitochondrial DNA differences. Um, okay, but that doesn't explain the nuclear DNA differences. So What's the nuclear? Yeah, but we've already agreed that the nuclear DNA shows high levels of homozygosity and highly inbred. It's very low genetic diversity consistent. Right, comparing them to, the, to, to, to our line, basically. Well, we're not highly inbred as homo sapiens. Well, it doesn't matter for highly inbred. We we differ in a number of genetic markers right. in nuclear DNA. Right. right. And I don't know the details of that, but I'm going to know it. I'm going to look into it. But uh, so I, I, I'm trying to figure out a steel man for your model. <laughs> and uh, the last Neanderthal being 1300 BC is kind of uh, kind of interesting. I think you're going to have trouble supporting that one. Oh, and uh, the, well, we find, well, here's the thing, though. We find all the different hominin so-called species, your human variants. They've all um, co-mingled, interbred. You, you know, I think it was some Australian aborigines that the evolutionists date to about 12,000 years. Now, I don't agree with the date, but they date to about 12,000 years with the morphology. This is another paper that I'll have to I'm just go on at the top of my head, but I'll, I'll get it to you guys earlier. I did give you the other one on the pit of bones in the side chat. I'm not sure if you found that, mm -hmm. but they found skulls just 12,000 years ago, according to the evolutionary time frame. Um, actually, before I go on with this, when do you guys believe, according to your uh, model, that Neanderthals went extinct? 50,000 years or something? Yeah, uh, I think most estimates put it at about 30,000. Okay. So it was far earlier than that. Okay. And the morphology in these skulls were like identical to Neanderthal. 
But the paleo experts could not conclude that they were Neanderthals because it was just, it was, it was too soon. And they concluded it was modern homo sapiens, but they had to because at that point, Neanderthals had, had gone extinct. So, but, and they even admit um, that if, the, if that's those skulls, if those bones and the morphology were found, let's say a hundred thousand years ago, boom, Neanderthal, Neanderthals for sure. But the date was so inconsistent. So the evidence does seem to suggest that we've all intermingled, uh, coexisted, interbred. Now the Neanderthals, yeah, they would have experienced rapid, rapid acceler accelerated genetic degeneration. It probably happened quick. I don't know how quick, but you, yeah, you got to look at all these, these describe even the Denisovans and how in, um, it was a shocker to, I got an interesting Joe Rogan video where he had a guest on talking about the Denise events and he was talking about some fascinating stuff and he was, he's a paleo expert. He was admitting like, this is not what we thought. I'll, I'll give you guys that link too, but yeah, to take the final word before my wife kills me and then <laughs> we'll continue oh, this talk. Okay. I have a couple questions. Number <laughs> one. <laughs> you trying to get me a divorce? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, the the real, oh, yeah. simple, real simple. Will you promise? Because I like to put the links in my videos uh, that you will send me. Let's see. Joe, Joe Rogan on Denisovans. So I can probably find that. But that one on the Australians of 12K years. Years. Okay, that one. Can you give me that link? And you mentioned watch rewatching some lectures. What lectures yes. are you talking about? So I posted one lecture in the chat. In, I don't uh, know if it showed up because I'm not moderator or not. But yeah. I got all my history. I'm I'm gonna send you two lectures. Well, put them in private chat. Right now. Well, I got it from my phone here. I, I promise you, right now. Everybody's hearing live. I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot them to you in an email because to be honest with you, I want you to watch these lectures. Okay, they're, not, if, they're, if, lectures, they're you're gonna love them. You're gonna and, okay. and they're up to date too. You're gonna love them. Okay, so if you don't let, let me be if you don't give me that paper and the lectures, then you have to give me a refund on all the books I bought. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait a minute, that's not in the fine print. But yes, you got all my right. word. You got my word right here. Okay, we have your word. <laughs> we'll see if your word is <laughs> All right, guys. Yeah, this has been fun. And, you know, we, we can even do chapter by chapter in, in the kind of like you ask question speed. This has been fun. I, I You know, you guys are respectful to talk to. I think it's it's enjoyable. So we can do this more often if you want. And I'll let you guys uh, have your fun now without me here. But uh, it's been a good 90 minutes. Guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, standing. Uh, please don't listen to the rest of this because we're going to talk about <laughs> you. Yeah, you're, I'll be sitting there watching a movie and my wife will look over at me and be like, honey, why are you crying? <laughs> I'll, say, my, I'll say, I thought they were my friends. <laughs> oh, my oh, uh, friend. RJ, wants, RJ, RJ wants another source. Uh, what, what source is he talking about? I'm glad, yeah, James Downard, he uh, he did a whole critique of Contested Bones, so he should be on top of this. Although I differ a little bit um, in some of, you're not going to find a lot of what we talked about today in Contested Bones, but um, James wants sources never. Okay, which one is it? Let's see. Oh, what do you want a source for this time? Yeah, what source? Lectures, lectures uh, possible glitches, one depends on plowing through it long. Okay. Yeah, we are going to get the transcript for this. We're going to analyze this, and oh, we're going to try no. to we're going to try to steal man your timeline, and I'm going to try to make sense out of oh the lectures. Okay, I'll I'll send them yeah. to you, Speed, and then you you guys are going to love these lectures. They're, um, are they by know? that uh, AIG? No, no, no. They're they're not creationists. Like this one is called Svante Pabo is his name. He's oh okay. Uh, a Neanderthal perspective on human origins with Svante Pabo, 2018, 157,000 views. Ooh, you're gonna love it. But yeah, no, this is uh, this is all secular lectures. Um, but I got a few I'll send to you as well as the Joe Rogan one. So guys, okay, thank you so much. Have you have too much fun without me though. Okay. Hey, oh, not too. Yeah. Peace out. Hey. Whoa, that guy's a lot of work. <laughs> It was pretty fun to talk to him. I've like I've never talked to him before, or really any internet creationists. And oh, I really? Like he, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess Sal, and unfortunately Maddox for like thirty seconds. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I want to yeah. keep that streak for for most of them. But Standing's a nice guy. I would talk to him again. He is. I mean, it's just I think the the fundamental barrier that's going to have to be broken. I mean, number one, like the dating conversation. So, and getting him to. Like get into the nitty gritty of de of dating stuff. Mm -hmm. Also, I mean, getting him to understand genetics is going to be like pulling teeth. <laughs>
Yeah, that was my biggest problem. He'd never, he, I, I would say this to his face, this was going to be my closing remark thing, but he left. But I, I don't think he ever really addressed just how unparsimonious that phylogenetic tree is where Neanderthals nest within Homo sapiens. And he right. didn't provide a mechanism for how they would nest within inside no. Homo sapiens. So the, I can kind of understand the way he does that. And it's because and I, I become more autistic trying to explain it. Mm. Uh, it. It has to do like with how he views like alleles. Like mm. He seems to think like that every allele in a like that every nucleotide in a genotype is an allele. Oh yeah, that's true. Specifies like a new allele. Mm -hmm. Which wasn't wasn't there kind of a shift from nuclear DNA to mtDNA kind of in the middle of things when we were trying to well, nail down these genetic marker problems? Yeah. Well, so what happened was, like I said, I did just a cursory Google search of like uh, single night SNP. Um, differences between humans and Neanderthals. And I really couldn't find that much, but I didn't look very hard either because I had like 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, and I found that one specific paper, but it was mostly referring, or at least that graph I found, was referring specifically to nuclear DNA. And he wanted to see it for mtDNA. Or he didn't say he wanted to see it. I doubt he wants to see it. Um, but if we could find it for <laughs> mitochondrial DNA, I feel like that would be a, a pretty good well, paper. Correct me if I'm wrong, though, um, but... SNPs would be fairly hard to discover. Uh, well, not discover. Um, they, I guess, like, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, they'd be hard to preserve, like, within species, wouldn't they? Because they're always suspect to, like, translation, um, not uh, transversion. Um, like, they're, they're subject from mutating into a different nucleotide, but also being corrected. Mm -hmm. Like from yes. whatever. Oh, from, uh, you mean backwards? Going going backwards. Yeah. So yeah, so that was a problem that the authors I found said. They said after like 1.6 million years, only something like one percent of the trans species nucleotide polymorphisms would be left um, between two different species. So that that is definitely a problem with that. But I still don't think like just the the chance of a bunch of different nucleotide polymorphisms mutating to what the chimp is like at that exact same site yeah is more unlikely than it would be to just say okay well that's the basal condition like this is the plesiomorphic nucleotide and then we're the derived ones right right yeah the thing is like snps are typically like they can be fairly deleterious based on where they occur yeah but, like having multiple of them occur like one after another and not being corrected seems like just unusual to say, <laughs> like unusual. Well, yeah. And well, that that might be why the the study was using nuclear DNA, um, yeah. just because nuclear DNA is more likely to be conserved. Well, right. not necessarily more likely to be conserved mitochondrial DNA, but like, you know, it it'll be it's more easily conserved, right, through like recombination and other processes. Um, well, wait, don't. Uh, it it could be. I mean. Bacteria, bacteria also, have, not bacteria, mitochondria have air correction mechanisms for when they replicate, don't they? Or yeah, I, okay, okay, so I'm not very good at uh, molecular biology, so I'll be talking out of my ass, but I'm pretty sure, well, okay, so it's just the whole idea that uh, recombination is primarily a mechanism to weed out um, deleterious mutations or not yeah. necessarily like weed out the mutations, but it's just to decrease the mutational load. And since mitochondria are haploid, that's one less mechanism that they have available. Right. Yeah. So they probably do have error correction in some way, but it's never going to be as accurate as a diploid. Uh, well, the error correction is mostly they die. Uh, there's a lot of negative yeah. selection yeah. pressure. Oh yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So, I mean, that's uh, if anything goes wrong with the mitochondrial D uh DNA, it is the, the mitochondria is not going to survive. So it's not going to produce, not going to survive. So yeah, that's one of the interesting things, like that people tend to forget, is that um, uh, mitochondrial DNA isn't linear; it's a uh, it's circular DNA, mm -hmm. which it's is prokaryotic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it replicates in a very, very different way than uh, than our cells undergo replication. Yeah, endosymbiosis though is one of the coolest things. Like. That's just mind blowing to me. Oh god, the, the border between life and non-life 
is so murky. It's crazy. So, I I don't know. Like, do do you listen to any like science podcast like in your free time or? Uh, not really. Okay, I'm open to it. <laughs> I would I would recommend listening to um, Mindscape by uh-huh. uh, on um Sean by uh, who's hosted by Sean Carroll. Oh yeah, I, I, actually I. Yeah, I'm gonna start linking his papers every day in the morning. The weather report. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Sean Sean Carroll does cosmology, um, like theoretical cosmology stuff. But uh, he was interviewing um, this person who was essentially like trying to uh, create a more general uh, description of life. Um, and one of the interesting things that got brought up was like that. Once you have protocells that form, like one of the issues that seems that's kind of a promiscuous issue, like with evolution itself, is that the moment that happens, you'll you have these um, molecular, you also have these uh, other kind of uh, molecular machinery that are highly efficient at replicating their own genome, mm-hmm. and you start this competition between. Or uh, an organism trying to preserve its genetic information, and you know, essentially survive, whereas other parasitic, you know, molecular, whereas molecular parasites are trying to uh, essentially copy their own DNA. Mm-hmm. And most times, the molecular parasites win out because it's easier for them to replicate their genetic information. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah, the the border between like life and non life is really interesting. Um, yeah, I think in the last hangout, I think in the after show, did I link you to that lecture series on the origin of life? Yeah, oh, you did. You did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I have that pulled up. Um, I haven't gotten to watch it yet, but yeah, it's uh, it's really cool. So like one of the recent videos they did, uh, I think it's discussing uh, like the geochemistry, like for the origin of life. Um, and one of the things, like, towards the end of the video is they had this uh, interview segment with these uh, Mexican researchers who are uh, – who have taken an interesting approach to the origin of life, and that is um, studying more, like, archaea species. And that's because mm-hmm. in Mexico particularly, there's um, – uh, it, it's either a river formation or – it, it's some kind of like water formation that it's it's extremely special. Like the volcanic plumes and the geochemistry there mm-hmm. makes it so that the water doesn't have very many doesn't have much material uh, doesn't have like very high nutritional content. Yet there's a boundary where like in the inner coast you can see like stromatolites. Uh, that are still present within that water and still actively living and reproducing. Um, but beyond that, like 200 meters, you know, down the line, you don't you don't see that any longer. Mm-hmm. Like like the landscape and the water changes entirely. <laughs> but I do think it's interesting, like uh, a better understanding of archaea, because some archaea uh, can survive under very extreme conditions. Um, for instance, there's one uh, archaea species that can survive up to 122 degrees C. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beyond the point that water boils. <laughs> uh, and it's, to me, I think that's exceptionally interesting. I mean, finding I, out the chemistry that... I don't have a wrench. What? <laughs> yeah, well, you know why PCR reactions have to ha- like be so um, so freaking hot? Like they have to get up to like seventy C or eighty C. Yeah, it's because you need to denature the. Um, it's because naturally, like the yeah. it depends on like the GC enrichment okay. in the DNA strand, but um, it's because like the 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 percent GC content influences like how high the temperature would need to be mm-hmm. for. Uh, Essentially, for those hydrogen bonds to break, yeah, and for that strand to denature. That's very true, and I totally forgot that was a thing. But another reason that it goes so high is because the TAC polymerase that they use was isolated from a archaea species that is inhabits like thermal vents and stuff. So the yeah. it polymerizes at these super hot temperatures, and like that's why it's most efficient. So, yeah, 
So Thermophilus Aquaticus, if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe it activates around like 80 C. Yeah. Um, there are organisms that uh, live in hydrothermal vents that survive like up to like 122 C. Yeah. And it's like extreme pressure that kind of like allows that to occur because the pressure like at that level in the ocean uh, prevents the phase transition from uh, essentially water to water to steam. Yeah, I don't. I had like a um an identity crisis back in you know middle school, high school area where I where I learned that I am essentially just a colony of bacteria, and then I relived that identity crisis later on in high school when I found out that like mitochondria are just more bacteria living inside bacteria that are living in me. Yeah, or not even living in me that make up me. Like all of my neurons firing that are my thoughts right now are just bacteria essentially. Like, that's crazy to me. Yeah, when I found out I didn't exist, I was actually kind of (laughs) happy. I tried to tell my dad uh, when he wanted me to do farm chores. I said, Dad, I don't exist. And and, and I can tell you why. And then he, uh, I think he kicked me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It didn't go over well. Anyway. I think the most shocking thing, like, because... You, you hear the old like tagline in like high school and bio and uh, in college a little bit. You know, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Yeah, <laughs> it's like okay, cool. So like mitochondria do stuff for the cell and you know help it along its merry way. And then you take biochemistry and it's like, yeah. By the way, if you didn't have these like mitochondria things, you'd be fucked. Yeah, it's like wait a minute. Oh whoa 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 whoa. <laughs> they do that much like we're we're that dependent on them like to do this metabolism thing like holy shit i mean right. it's just to me it's shocking like just how well, like, that was a magic sense, like, go ahead God. that was the magic of uh big animal diversity basically is my is uh the eukaryotic uh, complex, basically. That's where it all took off. That's where the complexity that we think is complexity. I mean, if we looked at uh, if we looked at bacteria, and we we would find even more complex, weird things. But the complexity that we know took off yeah, with the eukaryotic complexity. Form. Yeah, prokaryotes are probably doing things that would really surprise the creationists. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean what's like what's so curious is that pro- uh, prokaryotes have essentially like the same function as mitochondria do. They can uh, modern prokaryotes can also synthesize their own food sources. They have the same enzymes that are used uh, for the most part or their own variants of it. But mitochondria just does its own thing. Like it like it's completely, uh, like it's this completely like isolated structure that, for some reason, prefers replication. <laughs> yeah, it does it really well. Yeah, and it, uh, it's lost lost a lot of its genes to nuclear genes, you know, and being uh, imported. Mitochondria. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of genes are made in the nucleus and and. Uh, basically uh, imported into the mitochondria. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so there's the a lot of evolution. Kind of, yeah, and I remember watching a video on like, just how complex that process is <laughs> like to uh, kind of this, to kind of get the, you know, to get some of those mitochondrial proteins that are in, embedded in the nuclear genome to get into the mitochondria. Mm-hmm. Because some of them are small enough that they're permeable to the membrane so that they can just passively diffuse. Mm -hmm. But some of them are huge. Wait, is is ATP synthase produced in, like, the nucleus, or is that produced in the mitochondria? Ah, good. Good question. So memory is a membrane protein. So I think ATP synthase has, like, 41 different subunits to it. Yeah, it's crazy, and I had to memorize it. I hated it. You did? No. Oh my god. Why did it <laughs> so here's the funny thing about that. I believe it's some like 
something to the extent of like 18 of them are present in the mitochondrial genome and 23 of them are present in the nuclear genome so they share the responsibility like for atp synthase i believe or maybe it's the uh it might be the cytochrome c mm -hmm. family genes but still i mean you think about that and it's like <laughs> huh. i whenever i first learned about atp synthase i thought it was like the funniest thing because i always see the creationist arguments about like how how the flagellum is so complex and that's like oh just wait till they hear about these things <laughs> because well, it's and what's also, really what, what's also kind of interesting too is that even when you even once you have this um like this unity between the the uh, eukaryotic proteins for the uh, mitochondrial ATP synthase, so, I mean once you have those proteins together, essentially, one of the issues is that these proteins have to combine and fold with each other to form a proper ATP ATP synthase molecule, it has to be in its correct conformation. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's still under uh, active research. Yeah. Look what I found. We don't know how that occurs. <laughs> what is this? Oh, is this uh, like Beasley. model stuff? Greg Beasley? Yeah, it's some young Earth model. Silly uh, man, he wrote it out for us. <laughs> Yeah, Stanley, uh, uh, Stanley gave it to us. Uh, Steve, you gotta have an opinion on all this. An opinion? An opinion on um, mitochondria and ATP synthase, and I had one at 11, 11 p.m., but I think I'm not sure if I have any opinions anymore. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, the, the, the ooh, bigger, big flood. I uh. Standing for truth, you know, those guys have been calling me pudding brain and speed of pudding. Yeah. I think his job tonight was to turn my brain into pudding by getting me to search, search for all these links. And he did a pretty good job, to tell you the truth. The man, I got to hand it to him. <laughs> he, uh, we were spinning every which way but loose, man. <laughs> yeah, that is something I, you know, I, I mentioned this in me and Speed's private chat earlier. Um, is I think they're so used to like just poking holes in evolution and all that kind of stuff that they're not used to actually defending their own arguments and their own models. So whenever whenever Standing has to defend the idea that like Neanderthals are actually within the Homo sapiens clade, he doesn't really know how to. And I would love to see anyone try to debate like a creationist on geology but not not geology as in does old world geology fit but does new like young earth geology fit? you know what i mean i, I want to see someone do feasibility oh, debates about the young earth model and not actually the evolution model yeah the thing is like and i'm not a geo geological geology person at all yeah but like, even like some of the stuff i've listened to like which comprises youtube videos and very cursory understanding of the geologic column Mm -hmm. it, the Noahic flood is something that's like if you interpret it as global and especially like the creation model like they put forth in terms of like all the strata being laid down like at the same time mm -hmm. there, there is no way because like some of the um, simply because like some of the sediments that are formed like have to be have to be formed in a very specific kind of way. Like some won't form in water. Like chalk. Some... Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just gonna say, there's like chalk formations that would require like something like three times the biomass that's currently on earth to make. And those require millions yeah. of years to like deposit in slow moving water. Yeah, yeah. what is the rescue device for that one? They, I, I don't think they have one. They obfuscate. They they try to move to a different point. If you ever brought that up against Kent Hovind, he would just say, "Well, I'm not trying to teach my model in schools." And it's yeah. like, okay, well, your model doesn't make sense, like from any perspective. Right. It just it seems like inconsistent with observation, which is the ultimate. <laughs> yeah. The ultimate problem. <laughs> but yeah, I haven't. So I don't know too much about geology. I'm willing to learn, but generally that's not my my thing. I know what the geological layers are, but not actually like how you can tell 
that kind of stuff. Um, but the one of the big geology creationists is Taz Walker. So I had to I had to look up my namesake a little bit. And believe it or not, they're bad arguments. <laughs> you didn't need to convince me. <laughs> you know, I but going back to the molecular cell bio for a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of curious, like why it is that plants like are the only species that we know of. Like they kind of adopted chlor chloroplasts. Yeah, well, um, there's so there's multiple different types of uh, like the chloroplasts have come about in multiple different endosymbiotic events, right? So like algae actually nest outside of like uh, the plant kingdom. So there's types of algae that have uh, secondarily gotten uh, cyanobacteria through endosymbiosis, like outside of the original vent where it happened with plants. I think plants are just the most successful at like colonizing land and stuff. Um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah. Dr. Dan likes bringing up that a lot. There's apparently one type of cyano or there's one type of algae or there's one type of amoeboid actually. It's an amoeboid and it's currently undergoing endosymbiosis where it's adopting a cyanobacteria um, to become photosynthetic. Like, it's, like, as we speak, oh. undergoing that process. I, I haven't actually read that paper, though, but I could probably send it. I could probably find it somewhere. He he cites it in his debate against Ken Hovind, and then he goes, well, it's still a amoeba, and it's like, well, at this point, it's almost green algae. Like That must be pretty wild of a process, like, for endosymbio like for something to be endosymbiosed. Yeah, I wish there was a better verb for it. <laughs> I mean, because essentially what you're doing is you're that you're digesting the organism, all all except for the parts that are that you want from it, mm -hmm. which in this case is its molecular machinery, um, is its molecular machinery to create uh, or to fixate CO two from the atmosphere. <laughs> uh, sp uh, standing for truth just sent something in the comments, but yeah, endosymbiosis is weird. Oh, he did. Yeah, is it? I I don't know how. Like obviously it's different, but I I honestly just sort of think of it as like a codependence and stuff like that, as like you know macroscopic symbiosis with just a lot more integration at the molecular level. Yeah, I, I it's I think if I'm not mistaken, um, like heterotrophic organisms don't use. Well, no, they do. Do they? Hmm? I was trying to remember, like, if you, ATP is a universal among all organisms. Yeah, I can't think of any. This is what I remember, like, before I. Somebody asked me about abiogenesis a while before I had. Before abiogenesis became a hot topic in this. Um, yeah, and I. I or, no, somebody said what I could think of as potentially irreducibly complex. And I said ATP synthase or uh, glucose metabolism. Because I. I can't think of any species that don't use either of those mechanisms. Um, I still don't think they're necessarily yeah. irreducibly complex, but I think out of everything we have, that's probably the best argument for God creating the original like first cells and then, you know, heavenly panspermia, like producing life from there. Yeah, right. to me, I, there's interesting things. Like it's it seems that like having lipid systems can give you like replication on a very basic level. Mm -hmm. The thing that's kind of interesting t for me, at least like studying it, like studying a bio like from a very cursory level mm -hmm. is it seems like you need metabolism before anything else is go. Well, we'll be able to find out Wednesday, right? <laughs> I, I guess so. I mean, in, and part of the reason for that is, like, as you were mentioning before, like with ATP synthet, um, like with uh, glycolysis and things like that. Yeah. Remember, um, glycolysis is a process that requires an investment phase. Like, it requires two ATPs. And, like, the pyruvates. Going before it pays itself off. Yeah. In the end. Um, but as a matter of fact, like, the majority of biological processes require ATP. <clears throat> to function, anything that's not uh, osmosis, um, osmosis related. So I mean, uh, small molecules and um, like small molecules and ions can move through 
voltage gate voltage gated channels relatively easily. Mm -hmm. um, it's not too much of an energetic cost. Sometimes it's favorable for it to happen. But for if you want to get a protein transported like out of the cytosol and in and into the extracellular space, well, that costs energy. That costs a, essentially it costs the cell resources in terms of energy to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, that energy has to be storable. It has to be something that can be produced by, you know, these protein factories that are able to produce it. And to me, I mean, that's kind of an interesting, uh, like it's an interesting source of question about very early on, like for metabolic systems, what would be a, um, essentially like what would be an energetic substrate that could be used like for protocells yeah. to, you know, have that, to have that occur? Yeah. I don't know. This is why like abiogenesis is something that I've only like super recently started looking into because I mean, I've, I've been pretty open about this. Abiogenesis is not something I know much about or really look into. It was something that I sort of accepted after the fact I became atheist. Right. So like I went through a creationist phase and then I stopped being creationist, but I was still like theistic evolution. And then for a while I was just like, I, I became like sort of agnostic on it, but I sort of believed that a deist, position was probably the best because I didn't know how like life could have originated or the big bang could have started. But then I sort of just got comfortable with the idea of like, it's okay to not know, you know? And then I, I felt like a deistic God who sort of just dropped a few cells off and then like fucked off is it, <laughs> it, it sort of fails Occam's razor way worse than just, yeah, there's probably some chemical reactions. We just don't fully understand yet. You know? Yeah. It's, to me, like what I understand of abiogenesis currently, and I think this is kind of like where the field is currently, is it's a collection of very well built like hypotheses so far. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a very uh, strong, um, <clears throat> like it's a very strong description of both like chemical, uh, physical, geological, like and astronomical processes that. Um, like that contribute to both, you know, the 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 formation of the planet and also the how life started to originate. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, I think kind of the understanding is okay. Like if you want to make a cake, okay, you need the cake mix, you need the ingredients for the cake mix, you need eggs, you need milk, and you need um. Yeah, you need eggs and milk. And, and obviously, the other step is, <clears throat> and what, what currently seems to be the issue with abiogenesis is that to fully make a cake, like a cell in this case, you need all those components to react in a specific way. Like, so the components you have currently aren't a cake, right? Mm -hmm. You need some process that can unify those constituents and form like and form a functional cell. And yeah. that seems to be kind of, hopefully like that's the future of new research. Well, have you read that paper by Kunev? Uh, which one? Uh, the 2018 paper, the, the A bio guy, 11th dimension. He, I think he, I have. Let me. I, yeah, I, I, one, of, one thing he mentioned that was pretty interesting is that, like, if you had like little little clay pockets, like little micro pockets, that that is a micro environment for uh, that would simulate a cell, and there is a possibility that uh, lipid membranes actually formed <laughs> inside of those first, and there's just all sorts of. I mean, there are so many possible. Very uh, variations when you think about these microenvironments, and there's a whole bunch of things having to do with clays and minerals, and uh, all of the different. Uh, I mean, it's it's incredibly complex. I don't understand why anybody thinks that it couldn't happen, because there are so many different possible environments. And then Kunev also talks about uh, temperature differences. You know, these uh, cycling temperature. 
from uh, I think zero degrees centigrade to a hundred. Mm -hmm. And okay, I'm gonna answer RJ. It, it, anyway, this this whole thing about microstates, it, and that's why I was pushing back against putting ahead Anthony Maurice <laughs> because he 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 was basically implying that we need to take a bunch of chemicals and put them in a bunch of you know like one jar and wait for them to turn into life. Well, that's only one experiment. There are a trillion or quadrillion experiments we have to do in order to find the right one, right? Yeah. And I mean, and, and that's why, uh, what's the name? Hubert uh, uh, Yaki says that it is impossible. We're never going to be able to figure it out. And he did it with mathematics and proved all the different possibilities and came up with, the, with uh, this idea that we will never know exactly what happened. But what we're hoping is to find some pathways. And pathways we are finding, I mean, uh, how many papers a year? <laughs> About a thousand papers a year? Oh, it's more than that. I mean, yeah, we're finding pathways. So, it, it, and, and so, the, these guys go through this probability shit. They, they look at a cell and they work out the probability of how that cell would have happened randomly in, yeah. in a pile of pudding. And that's why I call Anthony Maurice Pudding Head. Uh, because that was his idea that, you know, that shit is going to happen like randomly. Yeah. No, that's, it, it's going to happen by path, by network pathways. I yeah. Mean, I'm probably I, beyond making sense tonight, but. Uh, no, you're good. Yeah. I find it just incredibly dishonest to try to assign probabilities to anything that we don't know all the variables for. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's a point that both Smokey and Anthony don't understand. That. To say like something is improbable or something like that, or to say something is like well designed in the same token, yeah, uh, requires that we know all the variables, like that are responsible for like life forming, and that contribute to that process. Yeah, well, not even just saying that like something's improbable. If you want to say something's improbable, that's fine. There's a lot of shit that's improbable, but like trying to just like put an actual number on it. Like the, the probability of me having this conversation right now is infinitesimally small out of everything that could have happened since the start of the universe. But would anyone ever try to put a number on how low that probability was? It's, it's essentially zero. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, it's essentially zero, but at the same time, you don't know what like any of the variables were that would have affected that. You know? probability. If you tried to put a number, you'd just be pulling it out of your ass. The probability of me being here after, if I were to have calculated it when I got up this morning, can you imagine how astronomical that number is? The number of the number of branches that could have happened for me getting out of bed in the morning. Yeah. To getting and, here, every and, day we run into this probability bullshit. Yeah, and one of them could have just been something as simple as like what you ate for lunch determines yeah. if you're here or not. Yeah. And so that's what I'm saying. Like you, you can't put a number on it. There's if a butterfly flaps its wings outside of your window, that could have affected it, you know? Right. The whole butterfly effect. So, so well. there's that whole thing where they're like, oh, well, the probability is one in ten to the twenty-six or something like that. And it's like no, the, the answer is you don't know. Or it's like ten to the fortieth or something. It's like, no, the actual answer is you don't know. Well, the thing I like to do is like, okay, I mean, okay. So you claim that the probability of a nucleotide forming is 10 to the 430 whatever freaking power you want to name. Yeah. Just how improbable is it that like you receive air given like the like the just just how the chemistry works there? I mean, you know, the chemist, you know, the that uh, an oxygen molecule of all things is going to be recruited by and within close enough proximity of a heme molecule to go through binding, to not be, you know, detached from that uh, from that heme molecule while it's being transported and fixated, and that it also, you know, gets converted properly into water or whatever it gets converted to, like as it's undergoing reactions <laughs> with hemes are being carried off elsewhere, <laughs> and it's like just. The number of variables to calculate that, it's a mind fuck. Yeah. Like, it's absolutely insane. Like, any reasonable person would say, like, yeah, 
that's pretty much impossible. Like it's it's just the the insanity like of how precise it needs to be is unbelievable. But the thing is, nature doesn't really care because it's you know we we ourselves don't live on a um on essentially on a one or done basis. Mm-hmm. Our cells make errors all the time in terms of, you know, like miscellaneous transcription and mi- protein misfolding and all yeah, sorts of things. I mean, it, it, it is so analog and stochastic. Like uh, the miRNA stuff is very, very analog. It's not a digital system at all. The control it has is very much uh, so. The uh, basically the consensus sequences that it attaches to are not always a good fit. And so there's just every variation. And even that, you know, that alone, and then you look into miRNA and it turns out it's got like two or three other things that it does, like uh, intracellular communication. And it just goes on. I mean, the more we discover, the crazier the cell is. It's just all this big complex of shit happening. And all that matters is that Basically, at the end of the cycle, the thing is still alive. It hasn't killed itself, you know, from random shit happening. It, it just has to get above a certain level. And I think that's what, that's one of the reasons why uh, mitochondrial RNA are important, because they give us a whole lot of energy to waste. And there's a ton of waste. So many proteins come out of, basically pop out of the ribosomes and get eaten right away and, and uh uh, nucleosomes or proteasomes. I mean, there's just a ton of waste going on, and all that matters is that the thing survives from day, you know, from moment to moment, and it barely does that. Well, and the thing is too. I mean, like the like one of the most basic information systems a cell like that bacterial cells have, and humans do have an equivalent. Uh, do have a uh, similar analogs in our in our own cells is the example of the uh, lag operon. If anybody knows what that is, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I forget like all the details of the lag operon, but it's this insane like process where, like, essentially the body can determine, like your cells can determine if they need to produce. Uh, it, like if the gene, like for the lac operon, needs to be, the lac on- operon is in single-celled organisms, I believe, like E. coli. Yeah, it's in bacteria. Very yeah. bad. But I believe it activates based upon like low, um, based upon like low lactose uh, concentration. I think but- it's glucose. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I keep interjecting. <laughs> it might be. It might be glucose. Um, and. But the way it does it, it doesn't measure the, uh, it doesn't measure like the concentration of glucose directly. Like one of the proteins, uh, I believe in, uh, in the lipid membrane matrix, determines uh, or kind of keeps a keeps a record of how much of a certain byproduct uh, from glucose metabolism. So like. Um, glycerate three phosphate or whatever it is mm-hmm. is being produced by the cell. Yeah. And when that concentration gets too low, it knows, oh, okay, so that means that we don't have food and because of that, uh, there isn't much glucose being produced any longer. Mm-hmm. So the glucose that like the the protein that um that handles the lac operon, it binds at, it binds the, the gene sequence itself. Yeah. And does that because glucose uh, binds in that active site and causes it to kind of assume this locked conformation. Mm-hmm. But when you don't have glucose present, uh, or not, when, when you have very like low levels of glucose present for the lac operon, it will deactivate. So there's no longer too much glucose, that protein that binds with the lac operon uh, represses, and the lac operon can be expressed. Yep. <laughs> and it's just, 
Holy hell. I mean, and that's just one function as well. You know. My uh, my intro bio professors would be so happy that I'm talking about the lack operon right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just like Speed was saying. I mean, you wonder how cells manage to keep themselves alive. And it's like, then you, then you learn about this kind of stuff. And it's like, whoa. Yeah. Like, okay, how did that... <laughs> How did that evolve? Like, how did that turn out? Because that's an enormously complex system, like for an exceptionally simple, like for something that's exceptionally simple to state. Yeah. Well, it's because yeah. our cells are shit at being efficient. <laughs> hey guys, uh, I don't want this to run too long because I'm okay. really looking forward to the transcript. Mm -hmm. And if, if you start getting close to three hours, Google or YouTube won't give you a transcript. Oh shit! Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, should we? Do you guys want? Uh, do you want to hear the uh, Jason Ezard meltdown? Should we do that live or should we? I, I've heard it. But I've heard it the, I say we broadcast it. <laughs> we broadcast it. Oh, I, I was going to save that for the uh, the. the oh, for Saturday, let's do it for Saturday night at the Atheist. Okay. We'll, we'll okay. Yeah. yeah, because it's it, I, I I like I. Uh, uh, Ian, we're going to do it on Saturday night at the Atheist anyway, <laughs> because we, we want what we want to shorten this so I can get a transcript. There was a whole lot of information given to us today. What I would like to do is try to come up with uh, looking at his model and trying to figure out whether or not anything in there is possible and to see a steel man standing's position as much as possible, right? First, yeah, yeah, and then. And uh, and 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 then we'll then we'll take it apart <laughs> because yeah. I don't think that thirteen hundred years of Neanderthal is enough time to create a Neanderthal in Neanderthal, let alone let them branch out and uh, basically inbreed and disappear from the earth. I don't know, but anyway. Oh, by, by the way, thirteen thousand years is or thirteen hundred years is generous, considering that we have like actual writing from Samaria that. I mean, predates the flood, if you're being honest. Um, but definitely from at least the time of the flood to right after the flood. And the Neanderthal range overlaps because Neanderthals lived in the Middle East. So we have writing. Like, they, they would have recorded, oh, hey, there's those weird dudes with big noses up there, like on that hill. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's something that people would have written about. Ian Ken wants to know what's, what's Twitter. That was my question about uh, three weeks ago. What's Twitter? How do you I Twitter? Don't know anymore. Ever since Trump started using it, actually, that's a lie. Yeah, I know. You know, I so sometimes my, it's replacing like Instagram is what I just scroll through when I'm bored. Yeah. <laughs> we, so we got so we got to go. We can we can chat for a few minutes. Goodbye, yeah. Ian. Uh, we're, we pro Goodbye, promise everybody. To on, on Saturday night at the atheist, and and we're going to revisit this subject. So mm -hmm. I think there's a whole lot of rich information was given to us tonight. So, yeah. ending broadcast. Goodbye.